Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and especially boys and girls. Welcome to this, which is part of the last day of Norwich Science Festival 2020. What a year we've had. But really nicely, we've managed to do a lovely science festival this year. It's been remote, it's been virtual, but it's been awesome. I'm here today with my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Jess French, and we have something quite special for you today. We are going to look at what it means to be human but we've had the unique opportunity to use and look at, sadly, a dead chimpanzee. Now, we have acquired this chimpanzee from a British zoo. It's from Toy Cross Zoo. What I can tell you is she was an adult female chimpanzee, nearly 40 years old. She had a very good life. She was very, very healthy, but sadly, she passed away not too long ago. There was no long-term issues, there was no bad welfare problems, and both Jess and I know the team who work at and run Twycross Zoo, and we're very, very pleased to say that we love those guys who work there. We got on very well with them, and we wouldn't work with any group who we suspected had bad welfare um, issues. Some of you might not, might not want to see a chimpanzee in this state, and I completely understand that. We'll talk about this in a second, but we both work with chimpanzees and other great apes and primates, both in a captive environment and in the wild. We both love... Absolutely. We absolutely love our them. primates, don't we, Jess? Yeah. I would much rather see a living, happy, wild chimpanzee, but in this very sad situation, it has given us an opportunity to use her as an education tool. Now, she will help us explain and investigate what it means to be human. Now, also, her body will be going up to the National Museum of Scotland after this, where, like the alligator dissection we did the other day, her body, her bones, her skin, her genetic material will help research, including welfare research, for generations to come. Now, my last point is, you can probably see that, unlike the other day, we're wearing much bigger masks today. Now, this isn't because there's a COVID issue. Obviously, we're all talking about masks a lot at the moment. But Jess and I today, are, and the whole team here, are wearing much more sophisticated masks. Because we're working with a primate, and especially a great ape, as we all know this year, there are certain diseases and infections and pathogens that can be passed between animals and humans. Now, she has been tested, and all the results have come back to show that she didn't have anything that could be passed to us. But just because of good protocol, good practice, and we want to be doubly certain, we are wearing these larger face masks today. So it's a little bit harder to breathe and speak, first of all. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to try and speak as clearly and as loudly as we can. But if you can't hear us or we start to tail off, the team here will tell us to be louder. But if you can't hear us at home as well, please shout out and we'll try. Now, over the next two hours, we've got our chimpanzee here. We've got a chimpanzee skeleton 3D model. We've also got an australopithecine model, which we'll talk about in a little while, and a human skeleton on the far side there as well. We'll be using these different skeletons to explain why you, every single one of you, are so special. But first of all, let's introduce ourselves. Jess. Hello, I'm Jess. I'm a vet. Um, I love all animals and I have a lot of respect for all animals. I do love primates. We both do. Um, that's actually how me and Ben met each other through, through loving primates and learning about them. Um, so I'm really, really excited to, to look at all of these specimens that we have here today and, and to look at this incredible chimp. Most of my experience with primates has been um, with gorillas and gibbons and New World primates, which are the ones that live in South America, smaller monkeys. Um, I'm fascinated by chimps, but it's just never, I've never really had the opportunity to get up close and personal to them like this. So I'm particularly excited to, to be able to look at a chimp so closely today. And as I said earlier, I'm Ben. I'm an evolutionary biologist here at the University of East Anglia. And a lot of my time before now has been spent working with not only primates, so the group that includes the apes, which are the small apes like gibbons and siamangs, the great apes like gibbon, uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, and gorillas, um, and also the monkeys, but also the prosimians as well, lemurs and their relatives, such as lorises and galagos or bush babies. The primate group is a really specific, wonderful, amazing group of about 500 or so different species. And I've been lucky enough, unlike Jess, who's worked in Central and South America, I've mostly worked in Africa and Asia and been very lucky to work with the great apes, including lots of encounters with chimpanzees. I used to live in Uganda, Rwanda and Congo and worked with chimps for several years in the wild. 
and more recently have spent a lot of time in West Africa with a different type of chimpanzee, a different subspecies, uh, in a more captive environment as well. You may or may not have seen uh, a series I worked on called Baby Chimp Rescue last year on BBC Two. It was a wonderful exploration of chimp conservation and captive care, but also the issues that our closest living relatives face. So like we both said, we love primates. We absolutely do. And Jess is right. This is a really exciting opportunity today. We were talking earlier that it is very sad. It's so Neither sad. of us want to be in a situation where we have a deceased chimpanzee in front of us, but we do want to use that opportunity. As scientists, as academics, as a vet and a biologist, this is an opportunity we didn't want to lose. Now you will notice that she's covered today. She has had a post-mortem at the, the zoo just because they need to go through and see what happened, why she died, what the issues might have been, and if there's anything that we can learn from that to help wild or captive chimps in the future. So we have covered her up. We didn't think it was quite appropriate to show all the, all the bits. And just to be respectful to her as well. To, yeah, yeah, more respectful to her uh, additionally. But also we wanted mainly to show the head, the hands and the feet today. So really it's worked for us as well. We're going to be going backwards and forwards and we do want you to send in your questions throughout and we will try and answer them when we can. Part of my reason, Jess, for doing today is yeah. because I teach this a lot. I teach yeah. what it means to be human. As an evolutionary biologist, we talk about the pro progress within evolution. Mm -hmm. We go from A to B to C to D. And what better group to look at and understand than ourselves? And we've got this idea, haven't we, that we are the top of evolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're pretty perfect, aren't we? Oh, yeah, absolutely perfect, especially us two. I mean, yeah, completely. There's nothing, I mean, you are the top of evolution right? Yeah I'm perfect I definitely don't have a bad back from doing that alligator dissection the other day at all no. Yes, well I, I also had a bad back after that and <laughs> do you, are you, I hate to ask, are you old enough to get bad knees yet? Well, my knees is, I'm a little bit younger than you Ben so I haven't quite got to that stage yet but I'm sure my knees will go. My knees hurt, I had an operation earlier this year on my neck because my vertebrae aren't very happy, actually we, we just said we are the top of evolution but there's a couple of things that don't pan we out are already. not perfect at all. No, oh, I, <laughs> me neither. And I asked this on social media, on Twitter and Facebook the other day, about what it means to be human and why we have bad backs and why we have knocked knees and why all these different things occur in us as a species. And lots of people reply saying, I've got bad backs, I've got a yeah. bad neck, I get bad knees, and I've got friends who are having hip replacements at the moment. I've got a very good friend who had a knee replacement, who is, who is definitely involved with, with this chimpanzee. In fact, someone who works at the zoo who's very young, had a, a knee replacement recently. It doesn't seem like a good idea if we are so amazing, why it's so rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hate to tell everybody, you are pretty rubbish out there. So oh. how's it happened? How's it happened? It's a long story, Jess. We've got two hours to Fantastic. tell a seven million year old story. So a question just come in uh, from Simone. What's the difference between apes and monkeys? Very good question, Simone. Um, do you want to go for it? There's a, there's a, a, it's a, your area of expertise. There's an easy answer and there's a much more complicated <laughs> answer. If it's got a tail, it's either a monkey or a prosimian. If it hasn't got a tail, it's part of the ape group. So it could be a small ape, like a siamang or a gibbon, or it could be one of the great apes, like the orangutans, gorillas or chimpanzees. If you've got down to primates and you're not quite sure which one it is, if it hasn't got a tail, usually an ape. There's a couple of monkeys that don't have tails either. But if it has got a tail and it hasn't got certain adaptations that you see within the lemurs, for example, like tooth combs, these weird little tooth structures that they use to groom themselves and, and a few other things, then it's a monkey. Um, there's just a very, very few species of uh, apes, but there's lots and lots, several hundred species of, of monkeys out there. But the true answer is it changes all the time. The definitions change all the time. And our understanding has changed in terms of classification within animals as well. So it's an ongoing thing. Another question. Hi, Miriam from Luxembourg. Um, also, welcome back, Linda from the Isle of Wight, who watched the dissection of the day. We've got some people who've come back, so thank you for joining us today. Our story, our human story, started seven million years ago. Well, it started a little bit before that, because time of the dinosaurs. Imagine T Rex, Triceratops running around doing their thing. A lot of people think there weren't many mammals around. I mean, most people think there's no mammals, right? Primates go back 
over 70 million years, the time of the dinosaurs. But our journey that led us right to this point now really kicked off about three million years ago. And it started with a hole in the back of the head. Now you're a vet, yeah. obviously, and you deal with a lot of different issues, a lot of different pathologies, a lot of different problems. Yeah. There's a, have you ever seen the hole in the back of a, an animal's head that should be there? That should be there. That should be there. The foramen magnum. The foramen magnum. Right, we're going to quickly have a look at our chimp and our human. Does the human skull come off? Catherine, would you mind seeing if our human skull comes off? We've got Catherine here today as well from UEA, our amazing lab tech genius extraordinaire. Thank you, Catherine. It does! Oh, perfect. I thought it would be much more difficult than that. Thank you. We've got our human. We've got our chimp. Very, they're very similar. Different. Oh, you said they're similar. <laughs> I think they're really similar. That's the weird thing. I just think they're slightly stretched and twisted and, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't think that your skull would look like that, but it's not a million miles okay. away. One of the most fundamental changes in our evolutionary past was, if you flip it upside down, there's not a big rubber tube in your skull, believe it or not, guys. It's this hole here. Now, every vertebrate has the hole like this in the back of the skull, and as you might imagine, it's where the spinal cord goes, and the vertebrae sit around it. You've got one right now. Now, if you put your finger inside the forearm magnum like that, on a human, it sits perfectly underneath. And the face sits like this. Now, where does yours sit, Jess? If you can turn it to the side. Now, either Jess is doing it completely wrong, or her finger is at a slightly different angle, because Jess's finger is like this, whereas mine is like that. And that's because the hole in the skull Jess has is slightly further back in the skull. Now, if you've got cats and dogs at home and any other four-legged animal, that hole, the forum and magnum, should sit right further back in the skull like this, like our chimpanzee uh, cousins here. But a human doesn't. Now, about seven million years ago, there was a massive shift in primates during what we call the Miocene period, it was about seven-ish million years ago, the world was a lush and tropical place, and there were about 200 species of ape around at the time. Wow. Imagine that. There were, have you seen the new Jungle Book? Um, yes. Yeah. Have you seen King Louis? Yes. The Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus, yeah. That was a real animal that lived I know, just several million years ago, so an orangutan that weighed nearly a ton. Whoa. There were lots of very, very different apes around at the time, but one of those apes slightly changed the position of that hole. Incredible. But it doesn't sound like it's much in terms of the impact. We talk about adaptations and evolution like massive teeth and horns and claws and wings and running fast. It's not a massive change to have the shape of, a, of the position of a hole. So what was the significance of it? What do you reckon? Something to do with standing on two legs? And about seven million years ago, that was the first time we'd had evidence of our ancestors moving their position. So we went from what we call... And we know about that just because of a hole in the back of the skull. Just because of a hole from one skull. Wow. There's an ancestor, we think it's our ancestor, an animal or a person, we're not quite sure which, called Salanthropus. Wow. It was the oldest member of our group, our primate group, that went bipedal. Now bipedal means two-legged rather than quadrupedal. Your cats, your dogs, your hamsters are all quadrupeds, we are bipeds, just means two-footed. Um, and that was the first time we saw that shift, and the only way we know that is because the position of the Literally, the only thing, the hole in the back of the skull, and yep. we know that it was not walking like that, it was walking like that. It looks like a, it looked very much like a chimp skull, wow. it looks really, really different, but that hole underneath has completely moved. Evolutionary now, biologists are quite clever, really, to work we, that out, We aren't pretend they? we are, we try. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a really cool thing. Have you heard the idea that we used to be chimps? Yeah, I, people say that there were chimps and there was this missing link and then there was us, don't they? Yeah. Now, not right? Not right. Oh, no. Jess and I have known each other for a long time. We both act a little bit chimpy sometimes, <laughs> and uh, especially table manners can be a little bit less <gasps> But we were never chimpanzees, were we? That's a massive misconception. No, we were never chimpanzees. No. We shared a common ancestor. If you put your fingers like this, that's you, that's a chimpanzee. At some point, about seven million years ago, we had what's called a common ancestor, a most recent common ancestor. That doesn't mean at any point you were a chimpanzee or a chimpanzee was never a human. So there was an animal here, one, some type of animal, and then it became a human and it became a chimpanzee. Yes. Perfect. And it didn't instantly go to human to chimp. There were lots of stages along the oh. way. 
Oh. And it's this journey we're really interested in. So how do we know? If they lived such a long time ago, how do we know what they were in between? Well, this is the very cool thing. It's almost like a jigsaw. You've got a thousand piece jigsaw, but you've got... Wouldn't it be nice to have a thousand pieces? Yeah, it would be amazing. It would be nice, but it's like you opening up a jigsaw for Christmas or your birthday, a thousand piece jigsaw, and you've got about 300 pieces. Oh, how annoying would that be? It's annoying, but... You get, a, you get a general understanding of the thing. You've got maybe a couple of corners, a big chunk there, a little bit there, but there's some, just some missing pieces here and there. That's what the evolutionary story is like. And so they're fossils, are they? Those things that we find, they're fossils, those pieces that we do have. Yeah. Um, we don't have genetic DNA from very far back. As much as we would be amazing if we could bring dinosaurs back from 66 million years ago with a squirt of amber-induced DNA, the oldest viable DNA we have is about 700,000 years wow. ago. So it's, it's well into the, the, what we call the Homo lineage. So Homo heidelbergensis, Homo antecessor, anything earlier than that. So Homo erectus, um, Homo habilis even, just within our group is completely unattainable. So the moment you're going back to things like Australopithecines and Salanthropus, you just have to go for the fossil records as well. So this one in the middle, this, yep. is a hu this is one of those pieces of the jigsaw from the common ancestor on the way to us, is that right? It is. All we can do with this is we don't know the links between them. So okay. again, it's, it's like having a dot to dot and you've got a hundred dots and you, you've been told that it makes a seahorse. <laughs> you can kind of get what idea what the picture is. We don't have that like this. All we know with this isn't a dot to dot where every bullet point, every little point links to another one. Some of this might be random stuff. So you might have your seahorse, your picture, yeah. you might have an octopus there as well. It's a different picture, but part of the same overall picture. The weird thing is with our ancestors, we don't always understand the relationships between them. And even things like Neanderthals, we don't fully understand the relationship between Neanderthals and humans. We know we interbred, we know there was cross-linking, we don't know if one led to the other, or they were just around at the same time, or what that relationship so is. So a Neanderthal, is, that what, is this what this is? No. Ah. So if you look from above, you can see we've got this lovely chimpanzee skeleton here. You've got your human on the other side. Now the human looks pretty, pretty uh, familiar, pretty recognisable, yeah? Oh. <laughs> I think I need that tube bit back. Pretty recognisable. And you've got the chimpanzee here. Now this chimpanzee has been laid out flat. Typically they would be hunched over on all fours, that wonderful knuckle walking position. But we've laid this one out so you can really see the differences here. And then you've got one in the middle. What does that look like? Well, first of all, before we do that, I, we talked about Silanthropus a little bit. It was this ancestor we think of ours about seven million years ago. And for the next two or three million years ago, we had lots of different ancestors that were tweaking this thing up here. Although they definitely weren't chimpanzees that had evolved, they were from a common ancestor, they would have looked a little bit like a chimpanzee, but more bipedal, more mm -hmm. upright. They definitely didn't look like people yet, but they didn't quite look like chimps either. They looked like some sort of weird hybrid, but they were about that sort of size. They tweaked that idea in evolution for a couple of million years. There was Selenthropus, Aurora, and oh, hang on. We've got a question. I think that's a really good point. Is the common mm. ancestor between the human and chimp, is that an ape? It is. It that's is. An and that, that's a really good question. So the common ancestor from us and chimps yep. was an ape. Because that's the apes ape. go back 10, 12, 15 million years, they were all part of the ape family. So okay. we are part of the ape family as well. So we're we are, apes too. We are. We are completely part of the, the great ape family. So yep. when I talk about the great apes, we're included as much as a chimpanzee, a gorilla, a orangutan. Yep. They're not just our closest living relatives. We are completely part of their family. There's always that one weird cousin you don't want to admit is part of the family. <laughs> we're like that for the great ape family. We're that weird cousin. Um, and they're more similar to one another than they are to us, really. But yes, they are. So what did we one. have here that was, that was similar to us? What makes, you, what makes us think that it was on the journey towards becoming us? Well, this is where it all went slightly weird. Okay. Uh, before that, there were quite a few experiments. They were tweaking things. And the reason this all happened was because about three, four, five, six million years ago, Africa was very different to what it is today. It's very dry in places, especially that eastern, sort of northern section of the Sahara, that Great Rift Valley in Kenya and Tanzania and up into Ethiopia, really dry, really barren, doesn't look tropical and lush. But about five, six, seven million years ago, it was tropical. There were palms and oases and reed beds stretching for thousands, hundreds of thousands of miles. And there were big animals. You can't imagine what, what, 
it was uh, what was walking So is around. that where our common ancestor lived in those forests? Yeah. They live in those forests. Ah, they live in those forests, but then climate change starts to really kick off and we start to see a lot of habitat loss, natural cyclical habitat loss where a lot of the forests retracted. They were lost and the area and habitats became much drier. Ah, so those animals that were perfectly <laughs> adapted to the forests then found that the forests were gone, they had to change. They either found the forest was gone or there was too much competition within those forests. Right. And those early ape ancestors or common ancestors of ours that could live on the outskirt of the forest, that could hunt and live and live in the forest, but also could go to the savannah as well and hunt a little bit between the two, had a slight advantage of those ancestors that could only live in the forest. So where was this guy? This was in, this is in when the it all really kicked off. So about three million years ago, we saw a new group turn up. We'd seen these weird experiments kicking off with, say, Lanthropus, Aurorin, Ardipithecus, some weird and wonderful ancestors that I would love to meet. And then the Australopithecines kicked in. So Austro, like Australian means southern, Pithecus just means like, like a monkey. So it's the southern monkey or the southern ape uh, that suddenly turned up. And it's southern within, within Africa. And over a very short period of time, these Australopiths turned up. Now there were two groups. The gracile, or the thin, the skinny Australopithecines, like this one here, or the robust Australopithecines, the Paranthropus. Out of all of our human ancestors that I would love to meet, it wouldn't be Neanderthal, it would be Paranthropus. It was the size of a five-year-old child with a skull the shape and size of a gorilla. Oh my goodness! So if you imagine a five-year-old, I mean, how old's your, your, your daughter's what? Three? three? Nearly three. She's nearly the size of a fully grown Paranthropus, but imagine... Wow. A gorilla, a gorilla skull. skull on top of her body. Yeah. That would be weird. There were some weird and wonderful cousins and relatives yeah. that we had, but then out of nowhere, these things turned up. These oh. are the Australopithecines. Have you heard of Lucy? Yes, I have heard of Lucy. Lucy is this very, very famous Is this Lucy? This is Lucy. This wow. is a cast of Lucy who lived about 3, 3.2 million years ago. So is this the actual size? Because she's much, much smaller than the human skeleton. Well, you've got your chimp. Yep. You've got your adult, average sort of human female over there. And yeah, that is an adult Australopithecus female. Wow. Um, and these, so these guys, were they walking upright or...? Okay, from your veterinary perspective, what do you reckon? You've got your chimp, who is a four-legged, knuckle-walking uh, cousin of ours. You've got us, with your, your lovely feet. I mean, the shape of the pelvis makes me think that these legs were... that this was sort of upright as it's laid out here. That's because over a period of time we had a whole suite of changes throughout our bodies that we went from this common ancestor to us. And there's about six or seven points across the body that really, really changed. So we looked at the skull. First of all, we saw that the, the position of the whole changed, but also oh, yeah. okay. hers, ah, oh, if you, that pops off, you can see where hers is compared to the chimps. There's a wee loose bit inside, that's all right. Oh, am I looking? Oh yeah, it's much, much more underneath, isn't it? Much more like the human, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's oh, much so that more... was on the top of her spine, like that. And it's much more balanced as well. There's a yeah. lot, if you look at the chimp skull there, there's a lot at the front of that, but not much at the back. That's right at the back, really quite heavy, and it sits forward like that. Okay, so the skull is telling me that it sat on top of the spine and the spine was likely upright. Yeah. What other parts of the anatomy are going to give me some clues about how she walks. The good thing today, we've got this lovely angle from above and we can really see the shape of the chest. When you look at the chimp's chest, you can see it's like this little funnel, this little wedge-shaped thing, really narrow at the top, really flared at the bottom. Yeah. You look at ours, ours is a complete barrel shape. So mm. when we walk, in fact, a little experiment at home, try and walk from one side of your living room or one side of the classroom or wherever you are, try and walk just a few steps with your arms just by your side and not moving your arms. Go. Not moving my Don't arms. move your arms. Now you walk back. Weird, isn't it? Feels really weird. How do you normally walk? Oh, I didn't even know I did that. We don't know we do. You never think, I'm walking, I'm swinging my arms, I'm swinging my arms. Try and walk without, without swinging your arms next time. It's really, really it weird. It is really weird. It helps push us along. It's an energy-saving oh, wow. device for our locomotion, but more importantly, you wouldn't be able to do it if you had a wedge-shaped chest So like chimps this. don't do that when they walk? If, if you managed to stand a chimp upright, yep. and it was taught to walk, yep. and it could walk and run just like we can, yep. it wouldn't be able to do that swing. Because it's, of this rib cage. It would be like out. a little tough guy walking like... I mean, chimps <gasps> do walk like this. Have you ever seen a chimp, especially babies, they walk in like a, a tough guy walk. 
We've evolved not to have that. And we're seeing slight similarities between the two in some yeah, of it's sort music. of between, isn't it? That's it. So there's a term there's a term that we don't like in evolutionary biology. Can you guess what it is? The missing link. The missing link. In the same way that we talked about living fossils the other day with the, the alligator, the living fossil idea is rubbish. If it's a fossil, it's dead. Yeah. If it's living, it's not a fossil. Uh, we don't have living fossils. So there's no missing link. There is no missing link. It's like the holy grail of what we're searching for. It's like some Indiana Jones quest to find something. There's no missing link. This isn't a missing link. This is part of the jigsaw. If, it's, yeah. if you have... And it's a huge jigsaw. But yeah, it's a parts. huge jigsaw. We're not looking for that one mysterious missing sure. organism or animal or being every time. So she's not a missing link, but she's part of that jigsaw puzzle that we're looking at. So yeah, she's somewhere between an ancestor that acted and looked more like a chimp and between us today. But she's got this mosaic of characters. So she, as you work down her body, you can see the skull is different, but also You've seen the position of the, the hole, but also the actual length of the muzzle is really different yeah, as yeah. well. Now we've got these masks on today. Yeah, we almost look a bit chimpy, don't we? We do look a little bit chimpy. Now first of all, behaviourally it changes the way we act, but actually if you imagine that was full of teeth, big teeth, a big jaw, yeah. it would pull you forward slightly yeah. as well. And that's because as we've evolved, our whole centre of gravity has changed. Oh yes, yeah, so we'd tip forward, wouldn't we? Yeah, so if you imagine you had something that weighed as much as a bag of sugar on your face, yeah. it would just pull you forward a little bit as well. And we'll talk more about central gravity when we go down a little bit. Now, this is the cool thing. All of this didn't happen at once. No. It didn't wake up one, one morning and go, oh, my face has shrunk, my rib cage has changed. These are gradual changes over time. And as again, as we move down the body, we can see other differences as well. Now, this chimp has a very, very short, what we call lumbar region in its vertebrae. Yeah. These are the bits in your back that get bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's very straight. Really nice and straight there. It looks amazing. So do chimps get bad backs? I don't, well, I've never asked a chimp, <laughs> but I don't think so. They don't see that wear and tear that we get. So by the time we're 35, 40, most of us will have degeneration in our backs. Wow. If you x-rayed us or you looked at our skeletons or with a CT scan, you'll see that our vertebrae, especially our lower backs, start to fuse, start to crumble. We get prolapsed discs, all these things that a lot of people at home right now are going, yep, got that, got that, got that, got that. So if standing upright gave us such bad backs, what was the push towards towards doing it? Because it must have had some benefit to us for this. It Am I did. asking that too? I want to come on to it on the very next bit, because okay. that links in to this thing here. And that perfectly leads me in there. Thank you, Jess. You've got the pelvis. Yep. Yep. So, so I'm this guessing... is the pelvis, this yep. is the pelvis, and that's the chimp pelvis. It is. From your veterinary perspective, what would these different types of pelvis or these different pelvis tell you about the anatomy and all importantly the locomotion of these different animals again? Because you might be going over the same point again and again and again, but this all builds up to this end point, this this big reveal at the end. Are you talking about where the where the legs attach in? Everything. I mean the shape of it, the the, the how shallow or how deep yeah, so it is. Yeah, so these are much shallower, aren't they? Yeah. I think these are wonderful. These are like some weird face mask, I always think. They're like some really strange, almost like a cow pelvis. They're completely flat, really elongated, like some weird, weird face design. Whereas ours are much more bowl shaped. They're like a big fruit bowl that sits mm -hmm. in the middle of our body. And that's exactly what they do. They just hold everything down there. When a chimp walks or a gorilla walks, you see these big bellies. Yeah. It's not because they're eating too much. That's just where their bellies sit. They're just different to us yeah but usually if we stand here you don't see a huge belly hanging over breathing unless well <laughs> sometimes you do with me but uh, not recently that's because our guts our digestive system sits in that lovely bowl we've got there right. and you mentioned the center of gravity a second ago it's completely changed yeah so when you have your straight back from your chimp and you're slightly curved back from lucy here you can see a slight curvature here yeah look at the s shape in so uh, that's not just the way that they've been put together, they are... That wow, is exactly, okay. hopefully, what well, if I turned you around and scanned you now and cut through your body with yeah. a CT scan, you yeah, should have this lovely actually, yeah. double curve in your body. Yeah. Have you played Jenga recently? Yeah, I love Jenga. Yeah, one of my favourite games, Jenga, is a very good game. Do you always take it from the same side? Uh, the little blocks? No, I try and do it from everywhere. Why? Uh, to keep it stable keep and it stable. to win. <laughs> well, to win. And you, you're very competitive, Jess. I have realised that it really is. 
if you did play Jenga, and try this at home, so play Jenga and if you've got a Jenga set, and just take all the bricks from one side and see how many goes you last. That's the rule with whoever's playing. Take them all from the same side. Then do it again and try and take some from one side, some from another, some from the and alternate. Yep. You'll realise you'll get much further along, and that's what our spinal column has done over oh, millions of years. It's compensating for this really heavy load, which is our... That's our big reveal at the end. That's the whole reason we become bipedal, the whole reason our spines are weird, the whole reason we get I'm bad backs... I'm starting to see where we're going with this. evolutionary it. Jenga. So for some reason we've gone upright. We've got something really heavy. Something really heavy yeah. that's worth getting a bad back for, that's worth completely changing the shape of your back, that's worth getting bad backs, that's changed the shape of your pelvis. And we're going to talk about why just yet, though. But the pelvis, you mentioned the position of the pelvis has changed. You can see that in our chimp here, you've got this lovely little femur, the thigh bone here that goes nice and up, and then slight angle, nice, what's that, 45 degree angle, I guess? What's the difference with the human one? Is it the I same? I mean, they're like sort of 90. I can degree. give you that. So first of all, your legs come much more... If you look at the chimp legs and imagine it was fitting... In fact, we can just... Tell you what, Jess, I'll run over there with you. I, don't, I think you should do this bit. Because I don't <laughs> know what you're... I'm learning here. If you have your chimp pelvis... In fact, if you stand up... If you look at me and you, our knees go in... So your hips are slightly further apart than your knees, aren't they? Yeah. Usually. Yep. Yeah. Most of us. If you stand up, have a look at yourself in the mirror. Your knees are quite close together and your hips are further apart. Especially, you might stand like this, like a superstar or a weird politician, but when you walk, your knees are really close together and they're further apart than your hips. So your hips are there, your knees oh, yeah. are much, much closer. Even though she's a model, her knees want to sit. Yeah. Naturally. The chimp wants to sit like that. Oh yeah, much wider though. The knees so are much, that? much wider apart. They don't have this lovely balance point in the middle. Um, again, the head of the femur is much more angled. That angle is right up there, whereas ours is turning around. So ours is becoming much more of a right angle. And if yeah. we evolve for another 10, 20 million years, that might change even more, we don't know. But um, the angle is changing as well. So we're starting to see weight-bearing differences in the hips as well. We're starting to see this bowl shape. Got another question? Did Lucy have body hair like a chimp or less like a human? Oh yeah, mm. I'd like to know that as well. That's a really good one. Okay, I'm going to come back to that one in a moment. If you remind me about the hairiness... I'll definitely remind you. I'm and there's another question there from Natalie. What was the other one? Question from five-year-old. Why did we start as monkeys? That's oh, a really... Oh, if you can answer that, you are a better evolutionary biologist than me or anyone I know. Well, I guess the thing is, it depends how far you go back, right? So we could say we started as monkeys, but actually we could say we started as single-celled organisms. It depends how far you go back in the story. So everything that's around today has evolved from something that was around, I don't know, how, how many years ago? 450 million 450 years ago. 450 million uh, uh, animals. years ago. So we didn't actually start out as monkeys. Part of our past is monkeys. Before that, it was some more basal mammal. Before that, I mean, it was it was fish. And then before that, it was single-celled organi organisms. It's a long, 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 long story. And monkeys are just one of the stops along our journey to becoming humans. That is true. But as to why we did that, there's no why behind evolution. No. It just happened. It, it just totally It just is a random thing that randomly happens. And if it works, it carries on. If it doesn't, it usually stops. On that note, though, yep. I hate to say this, you are 50% potato, genetically. Oh, thanks. Not just you, oh, me as well. Me. And the five-year-old who just asked that question, and everyone watching now, we share a lot of our DNA, our molecular makeup, with so many different organisms out there, and it's like a recipe. If you've got 50 ingredients, there's only so many things you can do, but you can make lots of different things, but you use the same ingredients. So it's a bit like, I want to make a leek and potato soup, yep. but I only have onions so I make a leek and onion soup instead yeah. and if people love my leek and onion soup I keep making it and maybe the leek and potato the leek and potato soup will be gone and I'll be on to potato and onion soup it's a bit like that now I like leek and potato soup but I like spicy stuff so when I make that I put a little bit of chili in and some people will go Ugh. 
No, you just have leek and potato. And somebody's like, yeah, leek and potato, but with chilli in as well. And would you would you have chilli or would you keep no, to your... No, I wouldn't want the chilli. You'd keep to your own. So we've yeah. already got different types of soup. Now, do you ever put little croutons in yours? No, you keep your croutons. So I've now got chilli and croutons in my leek and... And you've got um, leek and potato and I've got potato and onion and I might add some... I think I'm going to add some parsnip into parsnips? mine. Parsnips? No, I don't parsnips in mine. I'm going to put some aubergine in mine. So I quite like aubergine. That's been I roasted. actually quite like aubergine, so as well. like aubergine as well. I'm going okay. to put some aubergine in mine. And that happens in evolution as well. Sometimes, randomly, the same thing happens in two places. So Ben's put aubergine in his and I've put aubergine in mine. But actually, our common ancestor, our original leek and potato soup, didn't have any aubergine in it. But we just happened to end up with something similar. That's a bit like bats and birds. Bats and birds can both fly, but their wings are completely different. And that's like they've evolved their aubergine and another aubergine over here. So evolution is completely random. The things that work, every one of us is different. I'm taller than Ben. So if being tall was something that made me, um, was a real advantage in my environment, then I might survive. And Ben, I'm sorry, your, your, your shortness might make you die out. And if being tall was the thing that made everyone survive, then this species would continue to get taller and taller and taller and taller. Whereas if it was the other way around, being tall gave you some real bad, like all of the, all of the doors were only this high. And, you know, you really struggled in life because you were always struggling to get through doors. But Ben could go through all of the doors. Then the tall people might all die out and the short people would be the ones that would survive to pass on their genes. And we can see that as well, actually, because you've got the chimp and the Australopithecine, our Lucy there, who are separated by about three, four, five million years, but they're almost the same height. So already yeah. we're seeing these changes where the face shape has changed, the ribs have changed, the, the, the spinal cord column has, has lengthened and twisted, and the pelvis has, has changed. But, but there was the something good height. about being that height. Yeah. Well, there's not enough energy. that They need a lot of energy to ah. suddenly explode and become much bigger. Yeah, but you're okay. right, something has selected our ancestors to go from that size, about, about a, halfway up to your, 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 your whole height, to the height you are now. So, so do we know right. what it is that hmm? made them get bigger? How do we know? Yeah. Because even when we finish with Australopithecines, we don't quite know what happened after the, about the two and a half million year mark. But about 2.1 million years, there's about half a million, three quarters of a million years missing-ish, and it's become more fragmentary, suddenly a new group turns up, the Homo group. So Homo habilis, Homo erectus, uh, and eventually leading to Homo neanderthalensis, and then Homo sapiens evolves. And suddenly, even within the very first Homo uh, humans, they were much, much shorter. They're talking about here somewhere. And over time, we're getting taller and taller and taller again. So there is a selective advantage over time to be uh, taller. Okay, you mentioned your pelvis earlier, or the, the chimp's pelvis and yep. Lucy's pelvis. This links into something that I'm not an expert in. Okay. <laughs> there were certain problems with becoming taller, with becoming bipedal, with changing the shape of our pelvis. And you're gonna tell us about one of these quirks of nature that yep. has changed very much from when we were more chimp-like and Australopithecus like to something that a lot of people have issues with today. Yeah, so in evolution, we've already said the things that um, give us an advantage are the things that get selected for, they're the things that get passed on to our ancestors. So it would make sense that the way you come into this world, the way the next generation of people with all their changes come into this world is by being born, right? So it makes sense that if it's easy for you to come into this world, if your birth is easy, then you would think that that would be something that would be really strongly selected for. You would think yeah. the animals that come out easily carry on to live, and the ones that struggle to come out, they're not going to pass on their genes because often they're you know, potentially not going to survive. But that is not what we find in humans. So most other animals don't need any intervention in their birth. They can just be on their own, and the baby comes out. But humans, we really, really struggle to give birth. Um, and that is because some of these changes that we've been talking about, so changes in the pelvis and also changes in the size of the baby and in the size of the head. So the peculiar things about human babies is that they're actually, I know they seem small, they seem tiny, but actually in comparison to the mum's body, human babies are really, really big. 
And one particular part of their anatomy that is really big is the head. They have these huge, huge heads. And you can see that our pelvis has shrunk to allow us to stand upright. But that means that the hole that the baby has to come through has become smaller and smaller. And instead of having sort of an, um, having an, an angle like this to go through, where that hole is actually quite wide in that angle, everything becomes really, really, really tight. And actually, the human baby has to go through seven moves within the womb. It has to sort of turn around, do a bit of a, a dance to, to be able to even Just come to get out. out. Just well, you said that out. then, actually, that's really nice and flat. And actually, that bit there, the coccyx, points straight down. I've just looked here. Yep. And although she, I mean, slightly lay her onto the side, you've got this big bowl. You've got all the organs in here, the guts, I guess. And then she's got to go through there. Yep. And that whole bit of the back, that tailbone area, is really curved. It doesn't... It doesn't look like the baby would fit through there, does it? Doesn't it doesn't look great. And it's mad because... The chimpanzee, first of all, has a smaller baby in proportion to the size of its body. And it has this lovely, uh, sort of perfectly shaped hole for it to slip out of. Even more amazing, chimpanzee babies, when they come out, they're not completely helpless like human babies. They can cling on. In fact, they can actually help to pull themselves out. They're that advanced. They grab hold of the chimp's hair and pull themselves up her body. So, oops, sorry. So why would we select for something that has become so difficult for us to have babies? How has that even been possible? Well, it wouldn't be possible if we did what chimpanzees do. So chimpanzees, they give birth completely on their own. They take themselves away. They get their baby out and they have, you know, a little bit of time with their baby. We cannot do that. Most of the time, we cannot give birth on our own without help. So one of the things that had to happen within the human ancestor for us to be able to do that is we had to be the kind of animal that was going to help each other. You know, we had to evolve this, uh, this sort of community living, this caring about other people, this ability to communicate and say, I'm going to have my baby now, will you help me? This is... So we had to be um, cooperative, but also something, something to do with this pelvis being really small and this head being really big must have been an even stronger driver of evolution than the fact that it was literally difficult for these animals to be born. So what was so, so, so good about having this big head and we're this small there. pelvis? We're nearly there, we're nearly there. And when you showed me that then, the actual size of the birth canal is comparatively similar, isn't it? Yeah. So even though, as you said, the, 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 the chimpanzee infant is much, much smaller than the, the human, the opportunity to go through that hole is actually much easier for yeah. a chimp. And I've seen chimps with newborn babies in the wild and, and in captivity, and they just have a wander around, have a bit of food, go and see the neighbours, say hello, have the baby, carry on, and go for some more if food. only. What, is it not like that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, really Ben. Me, ben. <laughs> oh, Ben, no. I've got it lots of mums at the now going, no, Ben, it is not like that. It is right? not like that. <laughs> no. But you're right, it's weird. Why would nature, it's everything weird. we talk about is selective. Why would you so select something that has... So the only other time in the, in the natural world that I have seen problems with birth is the animals that we've domesticated. So wolves, for example, they'd give birth to their babies really, really easily. Um, and wolves are the ancestor of our dogs. But we've done some weird breeding to our dogs to make dogs that have big heads and small birth canals. Mm. So sometimes as a vet, I do have to do caesareans on dogs because we've bred them to be that way but that wasn't an evolutionary pressure that was us saying we think those dogs with big heads look nice we're going to breed them that way and we're going to um, intervene and do caesareans to allow them to give birth but nobody was helping these guys there, there wasn't someone saying we think the people with big heads look prettier so we're going to force them together to have babies it happened by itself but why so I actually read this well earlier this week that the number or the percentage of women in the West who need C-section assisted births has doubled in the last 70 years. So again, there's something that even now we're selectively, yeah. uh, there's a real trade-off between something that's potentially lethal and is lethal to many yeah. people around the world who don't have our, our facilities, yet there's a, there's a big payoff somewhere. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll still come back to it. We'll again. A lot of you will know what we're going for, but there's a big reveal why all of this, why all this terrible 
oh, a seemingly terrible set of uh, adaptations pays off. We've got some more questions. Did Lucy have hair, nails and limbs like us or like chimps? Do we know what she looked like? Okay, we'll come on to that. We'll, we'll do that one. We'll do it in two minutes. We've had that question a minute ago. We'll okay. Come on, we're nearly there. We're here. We're here. We've looked at the, the knees. They're knocking. They've moved in together. Again, Lucy's halfway between the two. She's still got very straight legs, very parallel almost. So Lucy, when she gave birth, they even though at this point um, they're starting to look very similar to humans, the pelvis is, you know, is very small and we've got the same problem that humans have, that the birth canal is quite small. In comparison, Lucy's head was still small. Mm. She didn't have this big head of the homo. So even though she had um, a small birth canal, the baby itself was still quite small. Its head was still quite small. So she probably wouldn't have had the same problems giving birth. The problem was the combination of this small birth canal and this huge head that had to come through it. So something has changed between Lucy, who's really actually, she's walking upright, she's starting to look relatively human, but her head is still way smaller and it's easier for her to give birth. So what... We still don't know. We're, still, we're getting there. We are getting there. And my final bit on the birth thing is when chimps give birth, or before they give birth, their babies don't turn around. No. Their baby comes out and I think it faces backwards, backwards doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Comes out, faces backwards, nice easy birth, done. We are, well, we know that with humans, when you had yours, um, they turn around twice. You get yep. two, you said there's seven movements, but there's yep. two particular two twists, twists yep. that the baby has to do just before he or she comes out yeah. and again Lucy is between the two so we estimate or paleontologists estimate that the infants of Lucy and her the rest of the uh, Australopithecines had to turn once so there's again that we're putting the baby in danger there's a real we again building up this really big payoff okay moving down we've got these lovely parallel legs but not with humans we've even got these these what I love you know I'm a little bit obsessed with kneecaps just going to put it I'm out there. Mine. I don't. I don't want yours. I'm as lovely as I'm sure they are, but they are amazing, and that's why I love the evolution. We talked about the hole in the skull earlier and how important just a hole is sometimes. You've got all these wonderful hips and this and look so. At what's the so special about a kneecap then? Because they're massive. They mm. are so important. And look at the the whole width of the bottom of the femur there, and it's what well, at least half the width, isn't it? So what does it do? Well. It's a cantilever, so it helps take a lot of the stress and strain when you're moving your legs. So if you've got... Uh... Oh, I should have done an experiment with this, shouldn't we? If you've got all your ligaments and your tendons and you don't have your kneecap, and you run your ligaments and tendons and everything else from up here and just over there, it's really hard. It's really, really hard to get any purchase, any movement, uh, any power there. But by running a little knobble of bone over there, allows a whole extra uh, amount of leverage. It really intensifies and, and uh, Also, it makes increases. it easier to walk. It makes it much easier to work, but actually you can take a load more force and more pressure, more weight Also, as you well. can be heavier. You can be much heavier, you can put more force into it, you can run quicker. It allows better flexion and movement of these bones as well. So, mm. Lucy's don't look that much different from the chimpanzee. So, you've got Lucy's, you've got your chimps. Tiny, aren't they? Yeah. Really, that's because they're not massively weight bearing. So again, when you see a chimp walking, they're not happy for long. And you, I've seen chimps walking, I don't know, 15, 20 steps, and that's really impressive, really unusual. Uh, bonobos can do a little bit more, very often when they're in watery environments. But if you look at the width and proportionate width of the whole uh, part of that, that leg there. Well, it actually massive. takes up a lot of it, doesn't it? Because this... It takes up a lot, but then you get to Nowhere us. near as much as ours. Pro- of course, it's bigger anyway, but proportionally, yeah. it's massive. And this allowed this huge extra weight to be taken. Because, again, if you're on So where's fours, the extra weight coming from? Well, Is it the head? If you're on all fours like this and you're walking around, a lot of your weight is in your chest, isn't it? Yeah, so Your yeah, central yeah. gravity for chimps is right in the chest here. When they walk, they walk like this. They're at a certain angle, and gorillas especially, their central gravity is right up here. Where's your central gravity? I mean, I'm not, uh, my balance is terrible, so it's probably over there, to be honest. Yours but. probably is. <laughs> okay, well, let's do a little experiment. If you stand on your heels, if you all stand on your heels. Yeah. Oh, would you? Yeah. I try and, <laughs> can you feel anywhere in your body where you're, where you're trying to balance most, where it feels? It doesn't yeah. feel up there, does it? No, it feels in there. Yeah. Our central gravity shifted over three or four million years where 
from well from chimps and things like Lucy. Would that be would the same for Lucy then? Would hers be down here? The moment you start to see this bowl shape, you're seeing the centre of gravity shift down. So her centre of gravity would have been right in here and ours is even further in. So our centre of gravity is right in our pelvis, right in our hips. Um, and all that extra weight is going straight down the body now. So whereas chimps and other like your dogs that you operate on yep. don't have massive kneecaps, they no, don't take tiny. a huge amount of weight. Yeah, so it's and they've all... got four of them, haven't they? So... Absolutely, yeah. So by having these larger limbs, these bigger kneecaps, they're taking more force, more weight. So again, yeah. it's just reinforcing that this thing has to walk on two legs. We've got some more questions. Which adaptations are helpful now, and are there any that are pointless? In terms of the ones we've mentioned so far, no. You couldn't be who you are today without all of these things we're talking about. And this is the wonderful thing. It's not just one thing that makes you special in terms of your anatomy. All these things have to happen for us to have had the success we have. And we haven't even really gone into the hands too much. Well, I want to talk with the chimp about the hands and feet. But we're nearly there. We move further down. So we're going to talk about feet now? We are. Now, I've got a problem about this. <laughs> uh, I don't really Oh, like... you hate feet, don't you? I hate feet. <laughs> I really don't like feet. I've got, I've, got a, I've got a bit of a foot fetish in reverse because I just don't like feet, Jess, at all. Aww. But I love talking about foot evolution. Okay. Because it is amazing. And for this, hmm, we'll talk about it here briefly okay. and then we can go see with the chimp itself. Now, we've got most of the chimp foot as a skeleton over there. Can we just grab that? It almost looks like the hand, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, very similar. Sort of really thing. weird because the big toe is out to the side. Yeah. yeah. So, oh yeah. So lots of people quite jokingly refer to chimps and other primates as four-handed. And if you're trying to, especially trying to get a baby chimp off of you, they just grab on and they've got feet holding you and hands holding you. It's really hard because their their big toes act very much like our, our thumbs. So why would that have been useful to them? Why would you want four things that act like thumbs? If you're climbing trees? Climbing trees. Climbing trees, move around trees. And a lot of primates, and not all, but a lot of primates have two thumbs and two big toes that can twist the side. Do you know there's a group of primates in South America actually, the spider monkeys. Spider monkeys that don't have don't thumbs, have do they? Thumbs, yeah. Weird, isn't it? And apparently because they can't socially groom, they cuddle to reinforce social bonds. Oh. <laughs> Weird but cool. I love spider monkeys. Anyway, that's for a different day. <laughs> but chimps and our ancestors had these wonderful big feet with these curved uh, big toes pushing off to the side. But so our big toes are completely different to that. I mean, they're not like thumbs at all. They're just like another toe, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Well, the position of that has completely changed. So why is that? What's Lucy got? I know Lucy's made that decision. Whereas some of the things Lucy's got, she can't quite. It's almost like she can't decide in evolution which way to go. She yeah. wants a bit of both. Yeah. It's very definite on the feet, there, isn't it? Yeah. Really yeah, yeah, definite. Yeah. Even though she's quite thin on the the tib and fib and the sort of what we call gracile morphology here. Because she's not weighing very much, she's gone down the human foot. Route. Her feet look completely just like ours, really, yeah, don't they? Yeah, completely. Because she's very, very quickly, it's paid off that if you can have feet like that, it's really useful. So now, does that mean she's not climbing trees then? We don't know. We so there is a uh, there is a bit of an investigation going on with Lucy, and there was a team of police officers and forensic investigators a few years ago who looked at the bones of Lucy, and they concluded. I don't know if I agree that she died from falling out of a very high tree and had multiple fractures all down her body. Mm. And this either suggests that, yes, they were climbing in trees and some terrible accident happened, or, they or were rubbish at she shouldn't have been in a tree <laughs> in the first place. So the, the jury's still out with Lucy, but we think they were what we call semi-arboreal. So she was spending some time in trees, but you're starting to see loss of these adaptations for tree climbing. And also the same with her fingers. So with the human hands, you've got these lovely long but very sort of straight bones here mm. the phalanges and, and carpals and those no, are metacarpals with a the chimp they're much more curved just to allow them to grip yeah. onto branches lucy's somewhere between the two again so the other thing about uh, about lucy is that her baby um was not quite as ad advanced as a chimpanzee baby so it couldn't grab onto her mm -hmm. so she would have to carry it around and i imagine climbing a tree when you're holding onto a baby just with one hand much harder than a chimp. Their babies just climb on their backs, don't they? They mm -hmm. hold onto their hair. And so that would have been really difficult if you were a, a mum, Mummy Lucy. It would for Mummy Lucy. And we're assuming Mummy Lucy had kids. But that gives another issue. So you've got suddenly, the chimps I've worked with, the mums go off to have their babies very often. And then when they feel safe, come back into the group. But they always have the opportunity to go up in the trees because 
Where I used to work in, in, in Africa, we used to see lions in the forest, we had leopards in the forest, even baboons would be a... Oh, imagine having to protect your baby against lions and baboons. Now imagine she can't climb. So again, oh, why would you yeah. evolve to not be... So suddenly you've got them where well, you've got to hold them, you can't climb a tree... And you've there got has to protect to be... them from lions! So would you want to be on no. your own? <laughs> well, you wouldn't, but how would you get over that? We well, didn't need lots of you to work together. So, yeah, so this is a, something that we see all the way through this. So as we progress up that evolutionary tree, or along the evolutionary tree, we see adaptations for increased social behaviour as well. So right. we think as we lost some of these advantages, like yep. big canines or huge uh, opportunities for temporalis and massive muscles, we saw increased social opportunities. And what about tools? Like, would they have been, would mm. they have been able to think to, like, throw things at them? Not throw things, but the earliest tools we have go back about three, two and a half million years uh, yep. ago, and they coincide and from the same places that we've found Australopithecines. So they're, they're quite... I want to say basic. They're, they're incredible, yep. but they're not as delicate or as fine as something like sure. a, a Neanderthal. But the earliest What about fire? Tools, Could you have waved some fire? Oh, it's a difficult one. The jury's still out. The oldest we think is about two million years yep. when we start getting to the Homo lineage. I wouldn't be surprised if they were using fire. Whether it was intentional or they were carrying I don't really know. But it would make sense if they were able to utilise fire. Whether they had brush fires and they were throwing things in the fire to cook it, wow. I know or not, we don't know. But we do think harnessing fire allowed this massive rapid expansion of the brain, which we're going to talk about. In a okay, can I just get this clear yeah. in my head? Go on. So, for, we have the chimpanzee, it's yeah. got grabby hands and grabby feet, it spends yeah. a lot of time up in the trees and it walks like this. It's not, it's not got any adaptations to walking straight, Yeah. up bipedal, upright, and it's really hairy. Yeah. And it doesn't have fire, it doesn't use fire. And what else do we know about the chimp? Um, very powerful, very, very powerful, very, very powerful. strong chewing muscles. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Perfect. And then so, we come to Lucy. Yeah. Lucy is walking completely upright, or more upright. Looking by the feet, we, she seems to be, her body so weight her is in there. So her feet and her pelvis tell us she's walking more upright. But she doesn't yet have this huge head. No, and she's still got quite a flared chest there. So she's not perfectly adapted no, for walking she's not, upright. So she's probably not doing long distance walking. Okay. Okay. Back on the feet, there is one other thing. So the big toe has moved to the front. Now can we, there's an experiment you can do at home. This is one of my favourite adaptations in human evolutionary story. Again, first of all, I love the hole in the back of the skull. Then I love the kneecaps, the patella, and my other, my third favourite bit of our anatomy is the position of your big toe. Again, I hate feet. I even hate your feet, Jess, but oh, I love where your big toe is because it's done something very cool. So if you put your hands out like a chimp, yeah. and imagine that's their feet. That's yeah. pretty much what they look like, isn't it? Yeah. Underside, we can have a look at this in a second, the, on, the, on, the, on the chimp, the sole of your foot is very, very flat. Yeah, with your thumbs or your big toes yeah, out like this. Yeah, completely flat, yeah. Now, in the First World War, and even the Second World War, if you had what's called flat foot, then you weren't allowed to go to war. You were excused. Because it was Why? such a... It tires the body out, you get shin splints, you get lots of pains, you can't march for very long, especially if you're a soldier, obviously. It was so debilitating that you were excused from going to war. Flat feet. So we don't want flat feet if we we're don't walking want flat feet. Okay. Oh, these are not flat at all. These are not flat, there we go. Now... That is a byproduct of the movement of your big toe. When you've got your big toes out to the side, they're nice and flat. And this is the experiment I want you to do at home. Have your thumbs out, so you have very good chimpanzee feet there. You've got Super your big toe, flat. you can climb, you can climb up things with your feet, absolutely great. But not good for walking. But they're not good for walking. Okay. Now, if you move your big toes in, so they're on, oh! in line with the rest of your toes, you get that lovely little cup. Yeah, that that's arch. what's happening. And that's here. what we've got here. And the moment you've got that, You've got this. You've got that springy ability. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because lots of the animals that do a lot of uh, a lot of walking and things, they don't have flat feet either. They have that sort of digitigrade or yeah, I don't yeah. know this. They walk like that. So your dogs and your cats that you usually work with and operate yeah. on have these digitigrade toes, don't yeah, they? Yeah. So feet? a dog doesn't doesn't walk like that at all. It walks sort of up on its tiptoes, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it's very springy, isn't it? Very, very, springy, very, yeah. very springy. My we... dog is very springy. <laughs> oh, we've got some more questions. Oh, Ooh, wow. We'll talk... So Jack's got a question. How do you think humans might change in the future to adapt to environments? 
that's an end question, yeah, Jack. We'll come back to that yeah. one, Natalie. And we've got me too. If Lucy was still climbing trees, why would she have evolved to have our feet? Ah, okay, that leads on perfectly. Why have these lovely feet? Why have these arched feet? She's obviously walking along there, is she? Yeah, yeah, she's obviously walking, but at the expense of climbing up trees. I mean, she could hide from predators up there, she can go get fruits up there. Remember what was, what was happening, though, about three million years ago in Africa? There weren't any trees. Well, there, well, there were trees, no? but there was climate change. There was massive climate oh, change, and we were seeing this climate change. mosaic okay. habitats. So rather than one massive belt of forest like the Amazon or yeah. Congo, you were seeing patches of forest here, patches of forest there. Yeah. So you either stayed in your tiny little patch of forest, yeah. which if that died out, you were in big trouble, <gasps> but you had to walk between these forest patches, yeah. or maybe you had to expand your territory. And been able to be able to, in order to be able to do that, you needed these arched feet. So it was a trade-off again. You could either stay where you were, live in that little small yeah. grove of trees with your... With your uh, and I guess you'd use it all up, right? Well, yeah, all the eventually. food, you'd yeah. use it up. And this, it is a, this isn't a conscious decision. These didn't decide, I'll have arched feet today. But some no, would but have the had ones slightly, who had arched feet survived. They could go slightly further. Right. They would have outcompeted the other ones. So this is a massive adaptation. So by having these arches in the bottom of your feet, you can yeah. walk not only 10 miles, you can walk 100 miles, you can wow. walk 1,000 miles, and you never get tired. And again, it's, it's an energetically efficient way of moving long distances. And suddenly, you've gone from this animal that had flat feet, like a chimp that was walking around quadrupedally, that needed its shoulders, that had large hands, that really wasn't as dexterous, and you went upright. And the moment you've gone upright, you can free your hands to look after your baby, to carry things, to make tools, to take well, supplies So you can use with you. your hands much, much, much more. So, what are our hands like compared to chimpanzees? Are they similar? Let's do a couple more questions. We've got one. We've got one hour left. Oh, we've got one hour left. That is a perfect time because we've got this wonderful opportunity with this chimpanzee here. Let's go have a look at her and compare okay. your hands and your feet okay. with, with hers. Tell you what, my poorly adapted spine is hurting. I'm going to get a chair. So if you have just joined us, uh, I'm here with Dr. Jess French, one of my very best friends and uh, amazing all-round vet. We've been talking about human evolution from a most recent common ancestor with chimpanzees between seven and nine million years ago. We talked about those early human ancestor pioneers like Salanthropus or Rorin, and we got to Lucy, this wonderful ancient uh, relative of ours, uh, an Australopithecine, an Australopithecus afarensis, and we're seeing a gr whole group of changes that take us from this quadrupedal, four-limbed, four-legged four animal moving on all fours to suddenly something that went upright, or someone that went upright and started using and started having some of the adaptations that we see today. Now, I mentioned at the start, we do have this unique opportunity today to work with this beautiful animal here. This is a sadly deceased chimpanzee. She's a female and she's from a British zoo. Uh, one of the very best zoos I've ever been able to, to work with and, and associate myself with. It's Twycross in the, in the Midlands in the UK, run by a really dedicated team of, of animal lovers, of experts, of vets and conservationists who, who genuinely love the animals they work with. Now this chimp was an adult female. She was very, very healthy right up until the moment she sadly passed away. They've had ongoing tests to find out what was wrong with her, and as far as we can tell, it's very, well, very much natural conditions and natural uh, uh, causes. Sorry, uh, she has been post mortem, so we have covered her up today. But we decided to make take the decision to have her here and really use her as an opportunity to demonstrate just how amazing both chimpanzees are and the adaptations that we've seen moving from a chimp-like ancestor to us today. So. Not everyone is going to like this, and Jess and I said right at the start, we both love not only animals, but we, we love primates. We, I mean, I've dedicated my life to working with chimpanzees especially, and seeing an animal like this, seeing a being like this, is, is always incredibly sad. It really, really is, but it does come with an opportunity as well. It comes with an opportunity that we can teach vet students. We've got some UEA students who are tuning in today. Uh, with Kelly's group, and we've got young viewers watching all around the world, hopefully. So, in an ideal world, of course, she would be alive with her, her friends, her family. In an ideal world, she'd be in the wild. But, as we'll talk about later, chimps aren't doing very well in the wild, and she is an ambassador who can teach us things both when she's alive and, sadly, when she passes away. Now, after this, her body will be going up to Edinburgh, where 
an amazing team up there are storing as many samples of different animals as they can for ongoing research for everything from welfare to evolution through captive care for the next several hundred years hopefully as well so her her passing away will be helping research for generations to come so jess you said i said i asked you if her hands what was different about oh, her hands what was different about her hands in the wild, you know, with a live chimp, you should never, ever touch a living chimp. They are incredibly scary animals, but they can be very, very tender, but it's not advisable. There used to be this idea that chimps were 10 or 15 times stronger than us, and they'll rip your yeah. arms off. It's not, not true. They might rip your arm off, but they're only about, say only, about two or three times stronger than us. But That's, they are much stronger. They are still much stronger, okay. but it's not this legendary King Kong-like strength. Sure. But it's the proportions of their limbs oh my goodness, and their look hands, how long her fingers are! Which I really... I just realised that. Wow! I'm not sure if the camera can get this, but this is an adult chimpanzee next to my hand <gasps> here. But her thumb's actually really small. So her thumb's really small, and actually my thumb is probably oh, bigger than hers. Fingers. But her fingers go from there right up to here, they're massively elongated fingers. So that's really good for swinging through the trees. Really good for swinging, really good for gripping, and actually, even though she's sadly gone, you can still feel, you can feel that, Jess. I mean, even though, as working with dead animals, you know that they get rigor mortis. They start yep. to stiffen up, um, the, the tension in the muscles. They're she's, like hooks, aren't they? Yeah. You imagine them hooking over branches. Even though her rigor mortis is gone, she's got that natural tendency to, even there, she's still gripping. But... It would be really hard for her to do fine motor things, I imagine, because... That's true. Well, she can do this quite easily, okay. but she definitely can't easily do that. No. Yeah. And that's really important. So one of the things that really helps set us aside in terms of our dexterity is this ability to, as Jess demonstrated, to touch thumb to all our fingers quite easily. And that allows very, very delicate. We can hold a hammer and smash stuff, and we can hold a needle and thread and, and sew it through. Now, as you said, it'd be much, much harder for a chimp to do this. Yeah. Now, we do see tool use in chimps, really complex stuff where they're using uh, stones and hammers to, to crack nuts, but they don't do a huge amount of, of precise movement. They see the stripping of, of leaves and things like this, but you're not seeing napping of stones that we saw. So is that the Lucy. only thing stopping them from using tools? Is that so the only thing, do you say? The only that? thing stopping them, for example, creating, I don't know, uh, like a, using a needle and thread or something, or is there another aspect? No, well, first of all, a lot of people say, well, it's something I hear a lot on social media, if, if we evolved from apes, yep. how, have we evolved from chimps, how come they're still chimps? Well, yep. we didn't evolve from chimps, as we've yep. discovered, but this idea, because something evolved from something else, it doesn't completely remove that first thing. Just because I was born didn't mean my grandparents disappeared yep. into a puff of smoke. There is enough room in the world for both yep. of us, but I'm very <coughs> different to my grandparents. And the same thing works with chimpanzees and other animals as well, they are perfectly adapted to their forest homes. Yeah. Chimps don't need to sew needle and thread. They don't need to do all these other things. Chimps can use over or feed on over 220 different plants. They have a whole suite of, of tools and, and things they can use. Um, they're perfectly adapted. I've got a question that just popped up. Sorry, Matt, I ignored you. What is it? Are the aches and pains we experience in later life because of increased life expectancy? Mm. Mm. Not really. Chimps can live up to, I think the oldest was Gregoire, um, who was a chimp who lived, oh, I'm going to test myself now, somewhere in Central Africa, someone will have to test me, but Greg, or answer for me, but Gregoire was a wonderful chimp who I think lived in the Congo uh, in a sanctuary, who was 73 or 76. So in s exceptional circumstances, chimps can live a very long time and they don't seem to have the same problems we do. I guess the thing though, I mean, this is the thing that I find daily in my job, is that you can't ask an animal, have you got any aches and pains? Like you have to, you have to read their body language and you have to see how they're moving and whether they're limping and things. But actually, we might have aches and pains. They don't necessarily make us limp. Like it would have to be quite bad to make us limp. So it's really hard to know, isn't it? The subtle things like aches and pains that animals are feeling. Yeah. And also we have these incidental findings. So when we see fossil evidence, for example, of someone like Lucy, or we would, if we were to scan this animal here, we might see prolapsed discs, or we might see yeah. arthritic fingers. I can guarantee there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven people in this room right now, uh, all socially distanced, and we're all allowed to be here. Um, but if I scanned each and every one of us, I can guarantee 
I would have incidental findings in this room of major pathology in at least someone's back, hips, or knees in this room. And I bet you don't even know you got it. So when I had a scan three or four years ago for something completely unrelated, I found that I had a prolapsed disc in my back, and the doctor said, it must be a lot of pain. Never felt a thing, uh, very, very luckily, because it's a minor prolapse, uh, never noticed. So even from the medical side of things, and from the physical side, from the fossil record, for example, you can't always tell, as you say, if a pathology means it's a, a bad thing as well. So it's a really hard question to answer. Um, but typically, as animals get older, they have more aches and pains, they go through issues. Um, and that historically was an issue in zoos. Um, where animals were kept alive for so long, but the, um, the, the, the welfare and the, the, the zoo, zoo uh, uh, veterinary medicine wasn't understood well enough, they would keep these animals alive, but they weren't keeping them healthy. We're much better at what we do now in, within conservation and, and zoo welfare. Um, so just an animal that lives a very long period of time can still be very, very healthy. Okay, so you've asked that with the... the Oh, that's it. Why don't they have the ability to, to build the tools that we build? Partly it's the dexterity, partly it is also the brain. Yeah. Um, they're not as advanced as us. It's so not do just they a have a smaller brain? They do, but they have a physically a smaller brain. In fact, let's go on to this, shall we? Let's yeah, really talk about time. why we are here. Well, in fact, let's do the feet very quickly. Just okay. We can talk about the feet. <laughs> well, because we've done the feet, we we'll get to the brain finally. <coughs> if you thought the foot was, the hand was impressive, and it is very, very impressive. This is a very long hand with these hook-like fingers. And actually, it's important to notice that they still have nails like us. Yep. Part of the primate uh, definition is, the, ability, is, is the, the, the presence of nails. Now, not every primate has that. Some of the prosimians uh, don't have nails, uh, or they have nails and claws, but chimps definitely have nails. They even, I'm not sure if you can see this, they even have fingerprints. Do they bite them? Have you ever seen chimpanzees biting their nails? I have never seen a chimp bite its nails. Um, although, to be fair, I know where chimp fingers go. Nice. I wouldn't expect oh. a chimp to bite its own. <laughs> I got very sick once when a baby chimp put its finger in my mouth um, oh. and had to have a very big course of uh, anti-parasite material oh, afterwards. Yeah. Just, um, but no, I can't imagine chimps would. They even have these wonderful fingerprints. So in terms of how related they are to us, we, we share so many of these characteristics. But the hand's impressive. But that foot is just something else, isn't it? It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. isn't it? So that is their big toe? And that's their big toe. It's so different. So for you as a vet who's worked with primates a lot, to, to ha again, to have this opportunity to see this is, yeah. is amazing, isn't it? And it's so different from Lucy as well. Yeah, really, really different. Now, oh, what you've just done there, if you try and push hers together... They don't. They, they don't, don't They just far. physically don't go, no. do they? They really don't. They're so far apart. They're completely... Even... You can see just behind you, there's a little print out of most of the foot. The actual angle of that big toe just comes out from such a point that yeah. it just physically will not move around. It's, no. it's yeah, even in depth. So that was a massive change, actually, wasn't it? For, Fundamental. To go from this foot yeah. to the now, human type foot. You mentioned this earlier, that when we were talking about the angle of her legs as well, they were yeah. like these, these reptile legs where they come out from the body and then down, which is something we saw in, in the... Alligator. The change from yeah, the change between reptiles and, and things like dinosaurs, but we saw with the, the alligator the other day. Yeah. Her, she's much more like that, where her legs come out at an yeah. angle and then down. She's her gait is just not ideal for, for bipedal terrestrial right. locomotion, is it? Right. But no, that that one little shift, that presence of the movement of that toe and the creation of that arch, changed our. So is it time? Is it time to talk about the most important thing? I think so. We've gone through. We've gone through everything so far in a piece-by-piece, step-by-step process. So their hands are completely different, their feet are completely different, their pelvis and even the hole in their skull has moved for them to have this upright position. But the crucial difference that makes us, us, is... Brains, isn't it? Our brains! Yep. It's all about the brain. It's one of the things that defines us as a species, this high... Highly uh, high encephalization, so this huge specialization of the brain. It's not just a bigger brain, it's the organization of the brain, it's the number of neurons, it's the connections within the neurons, it's the, it's the added little bits that we have that they don't have. Now, if you have body size to brain ratio, chimpanzees, for, uh, for nearly all the primates, they stand 
standalone, they are twice what you'd expect for brain to body size ratio. That's twice as high as what you would imagine for other... So they actually do have quite big brains. They have very big brains. Yeah, yeah. that's twice as They're what you'd expect smart. for other animals, other mammals of this size. It's yeah. twice as big as you'd expect normally. Wow. So very, very quickly, we see that these are very, very brainy animals. And yeah, we have seen an association small. between larger brains and more in higher intelligence, higher social structure, higher social complexity. So there is a bigger brains better off in many yeah. ways um, and we see this we see chimps live in social groups ranging from three or four to 1500 in yeah. uganda in, in a place called chibali for example so we see that we see all this complex social behavior tool use yeah they do use basic tools mm. don't they? oh yeah yeah and take, it can take up to eight years to learn how to nut crack successfully it's, wow. it's it's not easy stuff and they communicate with each other as well, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they have a whole range of, of vocalisations. It's not quite language in the way we understand, but they have a range of vocalisations. They have material culture. They pass things down to generations. They're innovative. There was a whole group in West Africa that developed and then started using spears just a few years ago to hunt wow. and kill bush babies. Um, real Planet of the Apes stuff here. Uh, amazing beings. I always... We're all animals, but these... These are slightly different to most of the other animals. These are... So they've got big brains. They're capable of some good stuff. Yep. But compared to us... So they're twice as high as you'd imagine of an animal that size. Yep. Ours is seven times larger. Ours is seven times? Seven times larger oh. than you expect of an animal of our wow. body size. So we have massively increased that brain size. So that's why we're so heavy. The tops of our bodies are so, so heavy because we've got these massive brains. That goes back to the Jenga thing. When we talked about balancing this thing, you're balancing a bowling ball on top of a Jenga set, basically. So it's, it's a massive trade-off. Got more questions. Where can an uh, Were there any organ, organ differences between Lucy and humans? Oh, hmm. We the, don't know, do we? We don't know. There's no soft tissue preservation for something or someone as early as Lucy right now. I would argue that because nearly all the organs are the same in chimps to, yeah, to humans... Yeah, they're really super similar yeah. in chimps and, the, and humans. Yeah, so. the proportions of the guts are slightly different, and I guess you'd see a shortening of the gastrointestinal tract, yeah. um, because they wouldn't be uh, as, as dependent on uh, heavy plant material. They just yeah. can't process them, first of all. They haven't got the heavy And jaws. also, we had fire, and we're starting to cook our food, so it was already sort of partially digested yeah. before, so we didn't need such processing power in our digestive system. No, and you're seeing the smaller dentition, so you know they're not able to digest as much heavy plant material. I mean, the chimp has very big, solid teeth, very big bone attachments for, yeah. the, for the muscles. We're not seeing that with Lucy, so we'll never fully know what her internal structure looked like, but we can, we can infer from uh, the skeletal material um, that she wouldn't have had that big uh, plant-heavy digestive yeah. and gastrointestinal tract. Um, but yeah, this comes back to the fact that everything we've seen, this whole trade-off so far, has been for a bigger brain. Um, it's estimated that we have up to 100 million neurons in our brains. Wow. Um, there's, there's a, a huge number of, of neurons up there. I think a chimp is around about 30, um, and estimated that uh, uh, Lucy would have been about 40. So it's not just a scale growth. It's suddenly it's, it's starting to scale, and then it's just massive. We just hit this huge peak of... And catalyzation. But the problem that comes with having that massive brain is that we actually evolved to the point where our heads got so big we couldn't come out when we were when we were fully developed, when our brains were fully developed. So baby humans have had to come out when their when their brains aren't fully developed at all. They're only 30% developed when they come out. Um, and it takes 15 years for their brains to continue developing and changing. Um, we've had to come out at a, a much more undeveloped stage. So we can't do half of the things that a chimp can do. That's why when a chimp comes out, it can climb up the mum, because its brain is so much further along in its development. Our babies come out, and they really need looking after because they can't do anything for themselves. Well, I'm guessing you'll know more than I do. When they first come out, you have to support the head, don't you? Their necks yep. aren't even strong. They can't stronger. even hold their heads up. It sounds rubbish. If you were designing evolution or you were in charge of evolution, you wouldn't say, I'm going to have this wonderfully big-brained monkey that pops out that can't lift its own no. head. And the way we've got around that is because as our brain and cranial capacity and, and, and uh, cognition has increased, so is our social complexity as well. You can't have one without the other. And that's why it's so, it's so important for me, as well as the bones and the evolution and the, 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 the genetics, we have to look at the culture as well. There is no way this can change in something more like us without relying on a, a more social uh, complex structure.
Um, why is their skin, so Olivia's asking, why is their skin leathery on their hands and feet? Well, I'm guessing that's because of all the swinging through the trees they have to do. They have to be quite rough because they're going to be using them a lot, aren't they? At the start of every summer, I do something amazing. I take out my flip-flops <laughs> and I put them back on again and they stay on until about October. Oh, they're not wearing shoes. Well, it's not quite that. Oh. But when I oh. put my flip-flops on for the first time each yep. summer, my feet are really sensitive and I get blisters. And over the next two or three weeks, they harden up. So by the end of the summer, I've got feet pretty much as hard, I think, as hard as a chimp's. Oh, so what's a baby's chimp's feet like? Are they much soft? softer. Are they, they come out oh. really soft, really gentle. This is just the, the, the body's response to wear and tear all through its life. Now, I don't, again, I don't work in a very manual job, I'm, I have to say. Yeah. My brother has a much larger hands than me, but his hands are much rougher. He's got much rougher skin, much more callous so this hands. Is He's occurred. stronger. This has been acquired. Yeah. So oh. she has, uh, if, again, I would also say that chimps in captivity probably don't need as, as, as thick sure. and tough hands as, as those in the wild either. Sure. So, Olivia, very good question. I think it's Olivia I know, it's Harry's sister. Um, if that's you, then great. If not, still great. Um, it's because they're going through very, very hard environments. And actually, you'll notice in the bottom of the feet, that should be harder than the hands as well. Because although they do swing through trees, they mostly walk on their knuckles, don't they? Mm. So they're saving these very delicate fingers. So these fingers are still, actually the fingertips, if you look at the fingertips there, Jess, and then you look at the toe tips, you should see the toe tips are much more calloused and much harder than the fingertips. Yeah, yeah. That's because they're in direct competition with the ground all the time, whereas they're not. They're very much in the knuckle walking there. So this is what it is. It all comes back to this. This is why they've got the big kneecaps. This is why they've got the arched feet. This is why they've got the, the change in the, the rib cage. They're walking long distances. They're walking upright. And it's all because to of this. They're feeding friend. this huge brain. So when we said that when a chimp has a baby, it has the ability to look after that baby and the yeah. baby can cling on, when Lucy would have had her babies, they would have been more dependent on her. And then when we have our children, totally dependent. completely dependent. Now that will either make you massively vulnerable or you've found a way of compensating. Yeah. Now we have, obviously we live in social groups, we're very clever, we can make spears, we can make fires, we can chase off saber-toothed cats or, yeah. or whatever animals want to come after us and chase us and wolves and, and, and the natural predators we would have. We've compensated for that. And everything we've done has been going bipedal and it's fed this wonderful large brain. Now we don't know whether, well we do actually, we know that we went bipedal before we saw this huge brain expansion. So it seems to be... And is there anything else that Lucy did that allowed our brain to grow? Was it because she was starting to eat new things? It looks as though she was. So when you lose that, that muzzle, we call it prognathism, when you yeah. lose that muzzle there, you lose a lot of those muscle attachments, you lose that uh, the huge teeth, that big chewing power. She would have needed that, claim we think slightly later than Lucy, this ability to really process your food, to start cooking your food. You can get a much higher level of nutrients, calories from meat, for example, because by cooking. Because brains take up a lot of calories, don't they? You need yeah. lots and lots and lots of energy. So do you think that may be why? Absolutely. So your brain, uh, and mine, weighs about 2% of your complete body weight, uh, your body mass, sorry. But it takes about 20% of the energy your body uses on a daily basis. Wow. So you've got something that represents that much, but it's taking that much. You've got to feed it, your hungry, needy brain. It's like you're like a baby that never quite shuts up and never stops wanting attention and food. You've got to keep feeding it. And so if you were just eating leaves all day, you wouldn't get enough no. energy? They've estimated that if a chimpanzee wanted to feed a brain the size, proportionately the size of ours in its body, it would have to physically eat for at least nine hours a day. That's not finding food or processing food, that's putting oh food goodness. in its mouth for nine hours solid a day wow. based on the food it Just eats. Just for the brain, not for Just the rest the of brain. the body's yeah. processing. Yeah. <gasps> and it would have a wow. lower body mass as well. So it wouldn't weigh as much, it would have this huge brain. And nothing else. And nothing else. But based on the food that chimpanzees typically and the way they process and don't process, they would have to eat for at least nine hours a day. Wow. They just couldn't do it, they couldn't yeah. sustain it. So this ability to have this huge brain has to be, we think, dependent on the way food was processed. They were hunting different things. Well, they were hunting more often as well. They were hunting, they were processing their foods differently, they were cooking, they were working cooperatively. Uh, and you've got this trade-off. All these things we've talked about so far is trade-off. All these negative things, these bad yeah. backs, these bad knees, these aches and pains, the problems giving birth, paid off because you've got a massive brain. Mm. So well, it all paid off, but then that's a problem as well. You say you've got this massive brain, yeah. Yeah. but it increases issues with birth, 
Yeah. We've got these these fontanelles. These again, I've never seen this, but I know that when babies are born, they have these little soffits on top yeah. of their heads, don't they? Yeah, weird. <laughs> are they gross? <laughs> and that allows compression when they come out of the birth canal. But it takes up to two years for that to, 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 to fuse, doesn't it? So you've got this wonderful epitome of evolution. With, with a hole in the top of its head. Yeah, with this huge soft bit on the top of its head. It just sounds really so weird. So something has to be protecting it. You're going to have to have uh, a community around it looking after that. And baby. that's it, yeah. Uh, Joyce, do chimps have a dominant hand? Hmm. Joyce, that's a really good question. I've got some friends who are doing some research at the moment looking at handedness in chimpanzees and a very, very cool uh, primate researcher called Professor Bill McGrew looked at what we call laterality in chimps and other great apes a few years ago. And he did find that there is, or there can be, uh, a dominance for handedness with chimps. And I can't quite remember, but I think it's a slight... Uh, increase in left-handedness. I'm not entirely certain. Um, I'll have to check on that one. Um, but laterality or, or in chimps uh, and other apes is, is a, a something that's, that's been looked at, but we've never seen that strong correlation to the point we do with humans. So we've really changed. We think that's, again, separating parts of the brain to do different things for different tasks. Uh, it's a byproduct of, of, of segregating brains off. Um, but yeah, this, it, the whole evolutionary story for humans never seems to make sense unless you think that bigger picture. Why have we got all these horrible deformities? Why are we? And again, the, the people earlier who mentioned on social media that they start having bad backs after their child number two or child number one. It's like, even when we have children, it gives us bad backs for the rest of our lives sometimes. Or I've got, say, bone uh, metal in my neck now because I've had surgery because my, my brain's too big. But that's the thing, isn't it? Our brains have evolved to the size that it has, and we have all of these problems, but now we actually have the capacity to think about how to fix them as well, which is just, that comes on to that, that question we had earlier about um, how we're going to adapt in the future, how, what direction humans might evolve in in the future. And I kind of feel like the only thing we're selecting for is our brain now, because we're so smart, we can compensate for everything else. So. We've got bad backs, but that's not going to be selected out because we can fix it. We've got, look, we both wear glasses. We've got bad eyesight. In, a, in another type of animal that didn't have the ability to make glasses, that would be selected away. But we're not get, getting rid of that bad eyesight because we're giving ourselves glasses. It's almost like we've, we've gone beyond evolving for anything apart from being smart. In many ways, I agree. Uh, there are a few things, such as the ratio of hips to, to baby head sure. size. But we do cesareans. That's it. So we're actually selecting for... So we're still evolving. We're evolving smaller and smaller and more smaller wow. hips. Because traditionally, even 100 years, even 50 years ago, it would have killed a lot of people who are having, having uh, children. But now we can get around that. And we've seen that with, with a few other things. We're also seeing... Uh, uh, gut biology is changing slightly, but again, we can control that with fecal transplants and, and nutritional adaptations that we can we supplement. We can even control that sort of stuff. But you're right, I think a lot of it is brain uh, brain physiology and then that's I think we'll see changes there. We can live in polar environments, we can live the top of Everest or, practically, and we can live in, in jungles to, to, to deserts. So we can really control our environment like nothing else. So yeah, I think we're, we're not going to see these big physical changes. I, I, have you seen the film, what's it called? Wally. Yes. At the end of Wally, we're all these big blobs that sit yeah. in spaceships with tiny little yeah. bodies with no bones in our, in our hands, apart from our thumbs, they're all texting and typing. I don't think we're going to see that. There isn't this push for evolutionary change physically. We're not going to see these massive physical changes unless something happens around the world, which it is right now. Yeah. Um, if we don't, we don't have the ability to control our environment still. But I guess that leads on to this idea, we've got, what is it, 30 minutes left, but this, this idea that we've come so far from this quadrupedal ape ancestor in just a short period of time, we're talking realistically of seven, eight, nine million years, we've gone from that to this, sitting in a lab with lights around us in a controlled environment where we're controlling ourselves and protecting ourselves against disease, we have our nearest living relatives in, 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 uh, in front of us here, and, and the differences are astounding. And yet with that comes responsibility, doesn't it, as well? Yeah. Yeah, and we're not really helping our nearest relatives, are we, at all? I mean, these guys in the wild, they're in a dire state, aren't they? 
they are. We think that over a hundred years, or just over a hundred years ago, there were about a million wild chimpanzees uh, found across Africa in, I think it was 24 different country states. That number's, we think, now about 100,000, maybe 150,000, although we don't still have a, a, a definite answer there. And they've lost four of their countries where they're found. In some areas, their numbers have dropped by 80% in 20, 25 years. And that's our nearest living relatives. So, so is there anything that they can do to evolve, to improve their situation, or is it down to us? It's down to us, and it shouldn't be down to them. I mean, they are, they're they incredibly adaptable animals. They do live in savannah. They are able to hunt different things and, and eat different foods. They're changing when they're active. They're, they're very clever, but they've, they've had millions of years to adapt to an environment that, that changes a little bit and cyclically, cyclically changes, but not to the point that, that we're seeing now. And actually, I think if it was just climate change, they'd probably be okay. I think they would shift as the forest shift, or they would eventually move into a more savannah-like habitat. Yeah. What they can't cope with is it's the habitat destruction. At, yeah, the habitat destruction, the, the illegal pet trade, the international bushmeat trade, the zoonotic diseases that we're talking about. Again, Uganda, just three or four years ago, a whole group of habituated chimps for, for tourism died because they picked up a common cold, a rhinovirus. They've evolved on such a similar path to us, but some of the diseases we have are very specific to us. So if we catch a common cold, yeah, you snotty nose for a few days, but a common cold can kill a chimp. So as well as diseases, habitat destruction, the pet trade and bushmeat trade, they're in big trouble. You know, in this one drives me mad. In about 2010, 270 tonnes of bushmeat was estimated to come through one European airport oh, alone. So that's meat that's taken from the wild in Africa and sold around the world. Not oh. to poor people who need the food, but as a luxury food item. Um, it's not sustainable. It really isn't. We've got some more questions. What is max height and weight they can get to? Um, it's said that we don't use all our brains, so why is it so big? Okay, two questions there. Um, the first is chimpanzee. Maximum height is about half the height of a adult human. So we're talking about a meter, well, just over a meter, I guess, a meter uh, 20, really. Um, which is slightly over half. Um, average weight or maximum weight, they're between 60 and 90 kilos. Um, a really, really big heavy chimp is about 90 kilos, big is male. Is there a I big guess. difference between males and female sizes? Yeah, so we do see the males are bigger. Um, so we do see sexual dimorphism where the, the males and females look different from one another. We'll see the males are slightly, in terms of the skulls especially, you see more lumps and bumps and ridges around them. They've got bigger muscle attachments. More um, so than in humans? Are they more different than a female and human? Yeah, it's a, it's a more notable difference. So we have about 15% difference in body size, usually in body mass between males and female adult humans. Um, we see more exaggerated differences. Not the same as gorillas. Gorillas are much, Yeah, gorillas much, are so different, aren't and they? And that reflects social structure. So you've got this really yeah. direct linear hierarchy yeah. and the big male is the big male. And yeah. you know he's the boss, you don't mess with him. <laughs> yeah. Whereas chimps, you have this wonderful, what we call fish and fusion society. So it's more like a, a series of human villages. They'll, someone will move there, then they'll move there, then they'll come back a little bit and change and go around and s change little groups all the time. And we talk about alpha male chimps, but you really see that in zoo settings or sanctuary settings. You don't really see alphas for very long in the wild. You might see for a while or if it's a small group, but the alpha, the, the alpha's not set in stone like gorillas. Um, so compared to a gorilla, the chimps are much, much more similar to us. And I suppose we imagine that Lucy would have been similar, do we? We think so. So there was sexual dimorphism between males and females with, with okay. Lucy as well. So again, the males were slightly bigger, um, slightly more robust, slightly higher uh, uh, increased mass. Um, and we see a reduction in sexual dimorphism when you get the more social group. Suddenly sure. you don't want these massive guys who are Because you all want to get on. Me. Yeah, it, you want everyone to get on, you want more cooperation. So the larger the social group, it seems, um, the, 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 the smaller the dimorphism. But that's not always the case, because things like mandrels are extremely sexually dimorphic. Um, so it seems to be with the human and ape lineage, um, but not right. always with things like geladas, uh, mandrels. In fact, the, the baboon group is a is a weird and wonderful group that doesn't always apply the same rules, but uh, yeah, macaques are the same as well, I guess. Um, yeah, so we have gone through this wonderful mosaic of changes across the last, what, seven million years, 
And a lot of these are lethal. A lot of these are potentially lethal unless you get help giving birth. For most people around the world, there's, there's an issue with that. So we, we, this trade-off in evolution is very much what's the end goal. And it is this encephalization, this increased brain size, this increased brain power. We went upright first of all. We didn't see that huge expansion of the brain to start with. And actually going upright, as we said earlier, allowed us to walk between forests. It freed the hands up to do all those little um, uh, very dexterous So it was the activities. combination of being able to use your, having your hands free, having the fingers and thumbs that work together to be able to do those tasks, and having the brain to be able to think of the things to do and to invent, I suppose. Yeah, this innovation, this necessity in the forest, when everything's great, you don't really need to be massively inventive you so know which trees you go for you things know... being difficult drove our evolution in that yeah. direction is that i love that phrase if you always do what you've always done you always get what you've always got yeah but if you suddenly change something if you don't adapt to that change yeah. you're gone uh, and i guess oh how much stronger is a chimp than us a chimp we think um from more recent research is about one and a half to maybe potentially three times stronger than us traditionally we used to say they're about 10 or 15 times stronger they're just not Next question, how do viruses jump from species to species if they are exclusive to a species? Well, viruses are constantly evolving, just like we are. So um, they, one small, it can, sometimes it can just be one small change in, say, the envelope. Surround, so some viruses are inside an envelope, um, which our body recognises or doesn't recognise, which can connect or cannot connect to a certain body. Just one small change can mean that it can jump from one species to another. Um, and, you know, that's what's happened with the coronavirus, isn't it? Uh, just one small, or it might not be one small change, but a series of changes in a coronavirus that was specific to, do we know which species it was? I don't think we do. do we? To a species, it's been able to jump and suddenly been able to infect us. Um, it's, it's evolution, again, but in a virus. And it happens really, really quickly because vi viruses multiply so, so quickly. Um, it doesn't take millions of years. It could, you know, a virus, if it's replicating every day, could go. We could go through a, a generation in a human is what, thirty years or something. A generation in a virus could be hours. Mm. So you see massive evolution in virus in viruses over a really, really short period of time, which means something that was specific to a bat can then infect a human. But the other thing is, and the problem with grey tapes, is that our bodies are so similar, the viruses are often recognised by our immune... The, vi the viruses that are recognised by our immune system are also recognised by their immune system, which is very similar. Yeah, it's square peg and square hole, but not all squares are the same. We might have a slightly smaller square, yeah. or a slightly more rounded square, but it still fits in there. So, yeah. as we said earlier, that... Jess and that's and why we've got to wear these today. No. And like I said, we are 50% potato, so we do share a lot of our yeah. ancestry with a lot of these different things. So the shared evolutionary history allows this swapping and changing, but this specific changes, these three, well, five, six, seven million years that we've been separated from uh, a, an ancestor with chimps means that we've allowed ourselves to have these really specific infections that we've accommodated or we've evolved to, to, to not really suffer from that might be completely disastrous for them, or vice versa. So we know that things like SIV, uh, simian immunodeficiency virus evolved originally in primates, most likely the green monkeys, which potentially jumped into the great apes, which then, as we were put in contact with it through, more than likely through bushmeat, um, uh, adapted, changed and evolved to become HIV. So very, very quickly we see these, these rapid changes. Because we've got this wonderful shared evolutionary history, mm. it's good and bad from, an evil, from a virus point of view, isn't it? And it's also the physical separation, isn't it, as well? So we might, in a city, if, have viruses that are evolving and jumping between humans, um, but the chimpanzees are not being exposed to those. So lots of ev uh, evolution of the virus is going on within, say, a human settlement. But then if one of those humans goes to the chimp's environment, it brings something new that's evolved and because our immune system is similar, we can pass it on, but they've never been exposed to that. That also happens with indigenous tribes. Yeah. Um, sometimes in an, in an urban setting, viruses evolve slowly and our immune systems sort of evolve at the same time. So the viruses, we, we get them, we get over them and we learn to cope with them. And as the virus changes a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, we are gradually learning to cope with all of those changes. But the virus that comes at the end of that evolutionary lineage 
is so different from the things that the tribe was used, that the immune system was used to dealing with, or the chimpanzee's immune system was used to dealing with. They haven't had the infections of all the steps along the evolution. Suddenly, that new virus at the end of the evolution is really, really deadly to them and can wipe them out. And it spreads between them really quickly as well. Which we see now. We also saw in was it 1492 with Christopher Columbus. He, he, Europeans went over to Central and South America, absolutely decimated indigenous and, and local tribes there because they'd not evolved with the same viruses and the same suite of pathogens that we had. So we caused untold damage for, for so many millions of people. And we still see the same today, as you said, with, with, with indigenous tribes. Um, if you could choose how humans would evolve in future, what would you change? I know what I'd change. Make them a bit kinder to the environment. And that is true. <laughs> yeah. A bit of kindness for other people, a bit of kindness for the environment, a bit of kindness for animals. If I could make one change to all people, it would be enforced kindness to everyone and everything. And then if we were kind to these guys, we would stop cutting down their trees. And then if we stopped cutting down the trees, then we would reduce global warming. It would solve everything, a bit of kindness, don't you think? I kind of have to agree that I would do the enforced <laughs> altruism now. I can't go, uh, I'd like wings. Um. <laughs> I would quite like wings as well, though. I mean, yeah, I but think the thing is, all of the, the animals that have wings have adapted them at the expense of something else. So to have wings, you'd lose your hands, yeah. wouldn't you? So yeah, yeah, yeah. everything that, apart from insects, which, again, are just amazing, but I'm not <laughs> going to go down that tangent. Um, everything that's got wings has adapted from hands, hasn't it? So... If you think of a bat wing, the whole of the bat wing, instead of having a long arm like this and then um, a hand on the end, their whole wing is just these three fingers that have been stretched out. Um, a bird wing is that with feathers underneath. The human, the forelimb of, of animals is incredible, actually. It's become so many different things. It's become a hand that can use tools. It's become a bat's wing. It's become a bird's wing. In a horse... A, mid a finger, a middle finger, has become practically the whole leg with a hoof on the end. Instead of having all of these other fingers, that's been elongated. This is made really small. It's just mad how much change has happened to the forelimb between having a, a hand, having a horse's leg, or having a wing. Even flippers as well. Mm -hmm. Flippers in cetaceans. That was that, the equivalent of their hand. It all goes back to the, whether it's viruses or is that tweaking, is that change, yeah. is that it, nature doesn't like to invent new stuff. It, it nicks stuff, it yeah. shaves the edges off things to adapt things slightly, whether it's elongating things or reducing things or adding one or taking one away. It's, it likes to do the simple version. But there's nearly always an obvious benefit, isn't there, I think? Yeah. Um, I think the other thing you said was, was what I would change would be... I, no, sorry, I think what I get a lot of is people say, well... You can't expect us to be kind. You can't expect us to be nice. We're just animals. In the same way that elephants destroy their own environments, if there's too many of them, that deer cause massive environmental damage. We're just animals. The difference is we have a sense of morality. We have a sense of theory and of And we're mind. doing the most destruction as That's well. It. So we have the responsibility to do something about that. That's it. And I think we've evolved so far down that line, we do have a sense of stewardship for every other species, every other person, whether it's a, a tribe on the other side of the world or whether it's our nearest living relatives here. We have that obligation, that duty to, to, we're not just, you either accept we're just animals and then you have the same rights as animals do, yeah. which are almost none, or you accept that we are special, that we have this, we can create these incredible laboratories and film this right now and be sat here in protective clothing. And the fact we have come so far in that evolutionary tree, we've got to pay it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important as well. Uh, we did have a question that I didn't answer. Um, well, two actually, in terms of, it's often said we don't use most of our brains. I'm going to use a cop out there and say, I don't study brains, first of all, yeah. and I study skeletal material mainly. Um, I wouldn't even want to touch the brain area because I think it's so complex. And I know there's lots of ongoing research into this. This idea that we use 10% of our brain, 15% of our brain, I think, from what I've read, we can't really quantify that. I, I would say that we don't know exactly how much of our brain we're using or not using because we don't know what the complete capacity is. With a, I think if, the, if you're doing lottery with 30 odd numbers or 40 numbers and there's this amount of many millions of combinations, if you've got 100 billion neurons in your brain, then how many connections are there and what is that potential? I don't know. So I, I just think there's an area of ongoing research that we don't really know. We don't know how the brain is being used to its full capacity. We don't know how much of it's being used to its full capacity, but I do know 
it's an ongoing area of research where lots of people are fascinated by that. And the other question we had was hairiness, hairiness in Lucy. Uh, we've got about 10, 15 minutes before we have to head off. But that was another trade-off. So at some point, we went from this very hairy, yeah, chimp-like ancestor. You can, yeah, I mean, actually when you see a chimp up close, she's not hairy uniformly all over. They no, do get ball patchy. patches. Yeah. She's got ball patches in her arms. And this isn't because she's been in, in a zoo. This is completely natural for chimpanzees. Some are more hairy than others, some just aren't. You can see around her mouth here, uh, she wasn't especially hairy. Um, so why do they have hair? What use is it for them to have hair? It's, first of all, it allows babies to cl climb on, as you said earlier. It allows them to physically hold on to mum. It actually allows thermoregulation to allow them to remain warmer. Because actually, you've spent time in tropical forests, haven't you? Tropical forests, do you just wear shorts and t-shirt all the time? No. <laughs> it's really cold, isn't it, yeah. at night especially? So by having this uh, little layer of fur or hair around you actually traps some of the heat as well, so it keeps them slightly warmer. The moment you go upright, though, and you're on the savannah, do you want that protective layer of heat trapping uh, hair around you? No, you're going to be hot, aren't you? You're getting hot. But this is the issue. There aren't any other naked animals on the African savannah. You don't see lions that are naked or leopards that are naked or zebras that are black and white but just skin. So there is a trade-off there as well. We think we lost our hair because as we went upright, we developed something more important for us. We're walking long distances. We're running after prey especially. And we think that in order to be able to do that, we develop a really lovely and complex sweat system. Oh. It, I mean, I'm under quite a lot of light right now and quite a lot of heat. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I'm quite sweaty under here, yeah, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't usually think that's a good thing, but I would just like to say I'm so pleased I'm sweaty because it meant that my ancestors were able, for millions of years ago, were able to walk long distances by getting rid of that sweat yeah. allowed us to cool down. It didn't allow us to overheat on the savannah and collapse. And it meant we had that competitive edge over our competitors, other primates, or more importantly, we think over our prey as well. So ungulates like hoofed animals that we were, we were hunting for our food. And to lose our hair um, was a small price to pay. It stopped trapping so much heat, but also it allowed us to sweat. And actually, by the time we were doing this, we could probably wrap animal skins around us. We were yeah. sat next to fires. So we think it's not a bad thing. And then we do have our hair on our head to protect us from the sun. Oh, because because we're standing up, right? That's the main bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? We've got just a few minutes left, maybe 10 minutes. You guys have been brilliant today. And again, like we said at the start of this today, we are so privileged to be around this wonderful one family. And we were talking earlier about, about her. And we both felt very differently, didn't we, with her as opposed to the alligator Absolutely, the other day. Yeah. And even other dead animals that I work with. And we thought a lot about today whether we should work with this chimpanzee or not. Um, and we are incredibly grateful for everyone at Twycross who uh, made this happen and uh, enabled us to, to have her here with us today. And fundamentally, we're, we're very, very grateful to, to her, uh, first and foremost. Um, yeah, this has been a, an amazing opportunity. And we, we want to do this series of, of dissections to really explore anatomy and really look at an animal inside out, quite literally. Um, and it's something we don't often do anymore. We talk about the fancy technology, we, which is really important, and it's great to have all this modern tech, but I think we've lost a little bit of the, let's have a look inside an animal. Yeah, and um, it can tell you so much. I mean, we've already seen from the skulls that just a hole in the base of the skull can tell you how the animal walked. Like, I just find that absolutely fascinating when, when evolutionary biologists find, because often you only get a small piece of bone, or, and the amount you can tell from that fossil or that, that small piece of bone about the way the animal lived, what it ate, um, its social dynamics and things like that, I just think it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? It is, and the more we understand about this, the more we can understand our place in nature, we can understand our evolution, we can understand the welfare of these animals as well. So some yeah. of my research I've done in the past is looking at the bones of chimpanzees from both captive settings and the wild and looking at the incidence of pathology in those animals. And yeah, historically, zoos, zoos were pretty rubbish historically. Yeah. They really were. And we saw, I've seen in my research, pathology after pathology after pathology in chimpanzees and other primates right up until the 50s, 60s, because we didn't know how to look after them properly. We mm. didn't know what they needed. We, we saw 
huge amounts of arthritis and osteomalacia, uh, osteomal osteomalitis as well, all these horrible bone infections and these metabolic bone diseases if we weren't treating them properly. And actually, her passing, as sad as that is, will help us understand more about captive needs in the future. And as you said earlier, I think I'm very open that I, in an ideal world, I wouldn't have zoos. No. But that doesn't mean zoos don't do a fantastic job when they get it right. But, as you said, they're not doing well in the wild, so these in are zoos important now, we also we are able to look at animals while they're alive. So there's, there's amazing monitoring that's going on using ultrasound, looking at great ape hearts. Um, it tells us a lot about their wild counterparts. Um, you know, we have, there are ways that captive animals are, are helping us to understand their bodies so that we can help the wild ones as well. Absolutely. We've got a question. We've got a couple of questions in. What do chimps use their strength for? Swinging through the trees? Swinging through the trees! <laughs> Pretty much, you need a lot of upper body strength with a chimp. And actually, in the same way that we were playing with the alligator's jaws the other day, and you said, if we closed them, you said, if you closed around them with elastic band even, you could stop them opening. If you get a... Never do this at home, kids. If you have a chimp that you're playing with, or that's, that's playing with you, um, if they're pulling your hand, they can really do you some damage. If you put your hand around a chimp's hand like that, they find it really hard to open their hands because they've got that power in one direction. So oh, even wow. if you put your hand around mine, I can open my hand up. They can't really do that as easily. And also, I, I have been lucky enough to work with orphan chimps oh. um, in, in Central, East and West Africa. And if you play with them and put your arms around them, they can't really get out. They've got no power in that way, but they've got that power in pulling. So it's all about pulling through trees. Oh my goodness, do Next you know one. this one? What do we know about chimps' emotional intelligence? What a question to end on, nearly. Um, that's from Natalie. Is it Natalie's given me that one? Thanks, Nat. Um, we've not worked hard enough today. Um, what do we know about chimps' emotional intelligence? <laughs> we know it's incredibly complex. We know they are able to express empathy and sadness and joy. They mourn for their dead and... There is a lot of evidence that's increasing. They show these really complex ritualistic behaviours. I was so, about to ask that. So do they have rituals? And yeah, like Jane Goodall, an amazing woman who did lots of research in, in the 1960s, 70s, and right up to, to today. In fact, it's her 60th year of research this year from wow. Gombe. Um, Jane saw, and it's been seen since, that the start of every rainy season, these little trickling waterfalls that were barely a trickle in, in Gombe, cascaded across with these huge sprays of rainbows and it would just sound really loud and she lost her chimps the first time she saw this and couldn't find them and worried that there might have been a hunter or a poacher and found all the chimps dozens of chimps around the base of this waterfall holding onto saplings swaying the saplings no. cooing at the, the noise of the uh, waterfall watching and she said she watched their eyes doing that for hours oh. and they've seen that multiple times now it's in, that's the difficult, difficult thing. It's impossible to say what they were thinking. Yeah. Are they celebrating it? Are they worshipping it? Are they just bored and think there's nothing else to do that day? We don't know. But we've yeah. also seen chimps more recently piling up cans of rocks around tree buttresses. Oh. But they don't use those tree buttresses to, to resonate any more than they normally would. They're not using it as a functional thing. So we've got this tantalising glimpse into the, the, the world of, of chimp uh, ritualistic-like behaviour as well. Oh. And that does help us understand things further back as well. So we have seen Homo naledi, um, uh, one of our more, more recent ancestors or relatives from South uh, Africa, who we think, we're pretty certain now, uh, they buried their dead in caves underground. Wow. How cool is that? And even Neanderthals, we know that Neanderthals buried their young, uh, or their infants, their children, very differently to they buried their adults. They often put them in under the skulls of interlocking horned animals with little fires around them. Or they cover them in red ochre if they were adults. So there's different funerary rites wow. for different individuals within the community. Um, but in terms of chimps, incredibly rich social behaviour, uh, emotional behaviour as well. What do we know about their teeth and why... Uh, and why, why are they like they are? are they like they are? Their teeth. So their teeth are big, chunky, solid, heavily enamel teeth. If you look inside a chimp's mouth, um, it would look like they've not brushed their teeth for quite a while. Um, and we can see that with this skull, this 3D print here. They've got these big canines, they've got these big incisors at the front, but they've also got these lovely big cheek teeth for crunching, for breaking. They've also got these big, big areas of muscle attachment here. So they have these big, heavy enamel covered teeth for chewing this very heavy uh, plant material diet, which we then start to lose. I mean, 
Our teeth are pretty rubbish, I'm not going to lie. They're nippy little things. They haven't got these big solid molars. We haven't got canines. How weird would we look if we had massive canines? Yeah. And actually, most primates have their canines as a, as a display reason. So we've lost... Yeah, so do they, they don't use the canines for their food. It's, it's not very... really, no. There's something like a, a, a mandrel, especially. Mandrels have, have huge canines, up to four and a half, five centimetres long sometimes. Whoa. But they eat fruits and, and, and leaves. So what do they use them for then? Sexual dimorphism. So it's a way of showing off to the, to the females. And actually, most... Oh, so it's like, I like your big teeth. Exactly. Hey, oh. hey, big teeth guy. Uh, and actually, we've seen that females select males once their canines are at least three centimetres long. So if we, were, if we were some young and single mandrels walking through the forest, and I was trying to show you my big red rump and my, my weird face, and you'd be like, show me your teeth. And we're like, oh, there they oh. are. But if they were only two and a half centimetres, you'd carry on going. You'd wow. want a bigger tooth guy. So there is a lot of information. So we've lost our, we've lost our big, heavy enamel tooth. Uh, but as you said earlier, it's because we're able to process them. By having big, heavy teeth, that adds weight to the front of our mouth that we don't need. So again, if nature doesn't need it, it's been, been uh, selected against. Uh, how long do they live? We've got five minutes left. So how long do they live in the wild? In the wild, we think chimps live between 50 and 60 years. I definitely had some in my group that were at least 40, 50 years old. We're, we're pretty certain. Um, Do you know that because they've, someone's been watching them since yeah. they were... Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, so how I, incredible to have seen I had a chimp life. who one of my team named Maria after his mum. And when we saw Maria, she was already very, very old. And someone thinks they saw her at least 25, 30 years ago. And I've known Maria now for over 20 years. And I went back two years ago into the forest. Hadn't been to the forest for 11 years, maybe, well, maybe 12, 13 years. Um, and the third chimp we saw was this really old, oh. grey lady, almost no hair, completely opaque eyes. And this is a wonderful social behaviour as well. Completely opaque eyes, almost toothless. Do they look after that? Yeah, elderly? so we see a oh. lot of, not the same way that we see in Neanderthals and humans, obviously. We do see care, corporative care in, in chimps a little bit. It was Maria. Still sat there. I, I never know how old she was, but she must have been at least 40 odd. Wow. But the oldest we know of in captivity, um, I think was a chimp called Gregoire, who was in a sanctuary in Central Africa. I think it was Congo, um, and he was 73 or 76 years old. So they do live very long periods of time as well. We are wrapping up, I'm afraid. I think we could talk about this for ages again. It's been really, really interesting. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Norwich Science Festival, who have made this whole thing happen, and the wonderful team from Norwich Live Streaming Services. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Jess French, wonderful friend and colleague and vet extraordinaire. I've had Catherine Barry here today, who's been our lab tech extraordinaire, and the whole team at UEA who've made this happen. The wonderful team at Twycross Zoo in the UK, in the Midlands, well worth a visit. Zoos are not doing very well in the UK right now, and they are uh, in desperate need of people going along and your support. So Twycross, you cannot do better than Twycross Zoo. And this wonderful lady here, thank you so much for helping us educate young and old alike. Thank you very much. We do have a wonderful grand finale to Norwich Science Festival 2020 this evening, where we have the Science Quiz Extraordinaire. It starts at 8.30 and runs for a couple of hours. There are some really heavy questions in there, <laughs> some really in-depth, investigative, got to really pick your brains against the greatest minds. Oh, I can see a note. No, 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 no. No, it's us lot. It's uh, myself and other patrons who have put the questions together. Some are quite silly. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. So join us tonight at 8.30 for our end of festival quiz where there are no prizes, just the glory of outwitting some of the biggest nerds in East Anglia. Thank you so very, very much for joining us today. I can see Natalie desperately trying to scribble something in the corner before I say goodbye. Well, you're right, Natalie. <laughs> Oh, God. Bye. It's been ape-tastic. That was, uh, I'm glad was you managed to get that for, one in just I? before the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. So this year, Norwich Science Festival has tried to bring you as much as we possibly can. This year has been very, very tough for everybody, of course, but we wanted to make sure you had something this year that you could join in with. And people behind the scenes at UEA and other organisations, and obviously the Science Festival organisers themselves, have worked flat out to bring you just a taste of what we would like to bring you next year. If you want to support Norwich Science Festival, please get in touch with Natalie Bailey and the rest of the team, because we want to make sure this happens again next year, bigger and better than ever before. 
Thank you very much. See you tonight. Stay geeky.